perspective uh, as we contribute to this discussion. So I would like now to introduce our first speaker for today. Uh, Anne Maina, Anne, please uh, be ready. If you have uh, material to present, you can be uh, showing it, you can be projecting. As I introduce you, so Anne Maina is a national coordinator of the Biodiversity and Biosafety Association of Kenya. And she has been actively working on challenging for solutions that are being pushed in Africa related to genetic engineering and other topics such as biofuels, the push for a green revolution in Africa, carbon markets, which is a topical issue currently, and other strategies to cope with climate change in Africa. She has been very instrumental in the growth and development of networks such as the Eastern and Southern Africa Small Scale Farmers Forum, the Participatory Ecological Land Use Management, and the Alliance for Food Sovereignty in Africa, among as many other networks in Africa. She is well informed on the issues that are in the topic for today. We welcome you, Anne. Please make your presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor. And uh, thank you very much to the KU uh, fraternity for this opportunity to share some of our concerns about uh, genetically modified uh, foods or organisms in Kenya. I'm going to share some of the concerns that we have, and I hope we'll have uh, some lively discussions after that. Um, I want to begin by um, sharing some of the myths or issues that we have concerning uh, genetically modified foods, uh, issues of food security, nutrition, health, pest and weed control, poverty er alleviation, water and drought resistance, as uh, the cost of seeds and packaging, and of course, issues related to biodiversity. And I'm sure most of you uh, know what GMOs are, uh, most are from the uh, research field. These are projects of recombinant DNA technology with the aim to alter the genetic sequence of the plant or the animal uh, and express a desired trait. They are actually new life forms and have never occurred in nature before. The biggest controversial issues about them is that they cross the, the species barrier. On most occasions, uh, you find like you can cross uh, the Bt uh, variety, the Bacillus thuringiensis, from the soil and add it to the meal. Kindly mute yourself if you have your speaker on. Um, the most uh, crops that we have that have been genetically commercialized in the US uh, which uh, began growing GMOs in 1996, uh, cotton. And here we have uh, insect resistant cotton and herbicide tolerant. Uh, we have the sugar beet, which mostly is used to produce sugar, just, just like sugar cane. Uh, we have the um, soya beans, which is herbicide tolerant, uh, insect resistant, herbicide tolerant and drought tolerant corn or maize. And we have research going on in Kenya on water efficient maize for Africa and now Tela uh, on the drought resistance. Then we have herbicide tolerant canola, mostly for oil. We also have virus resistant uh, papaya or papai, uh, herbicide tolerant alfalfa and summer squash. Of course, there's a lot of research going on uh, on other crops, but this uh, we I just picked on this uh, on the different traits available. Uh, we keep on hearing about GMOs and the fact that they will improve food security, but the truth is that the agribusiness and a lot of the promotion of GMO uh, from the developed world is not to feed uh, the people, but has uh, four issues, other, other uses like animal feed, biofuel, fi fiber, and processed foods. And of course, the most predominant GM crops are maize, soya, cotton, and can canola, which are being promoted for this. Uh, the issue of nutritious foods, uh, uh, let me give an example of golden rice, which was first uh, uh, hit the headlines in 2000 with the claim that the rice would save a million kids a year. It was a, a biofortification of the rice with vitamin A and iron uh, to prevent anemia and blindness, especially among children in Asia. But unfortunately, uh, more research showed that uh, it contained very little vitamin A 
uh, to combat vitamin A deficiency. And worse still, the rice when cooked, the amount of provitamin A was reduced by another 40, uh, almost 50%. And uh, no animal feeding trials have been done or published on the toxicological safety uh, on golden rice. And uh, some arguments were put forward, which are quite true. A vegetable one carrot a day or tomatoes are enough to give vitamin A, as opposed to this golden rice, which was being uh, promoted as a biofortification uh, to support uh, um, in terms of vitamin A and iron deficiency. And what was interesting is that an, on average, a uh, two-year-old child would have to eat at least three kilos of golden rice a day to reach the recommended daily intake, yet they could have this from one carrot. And of course, we have other crops like the millets, the sorghums, the teff, and other crops in Africa that are quite more nutritious as opposed to the this uh, so much dependence on maize, even when our government speaks of food security, it's all about maize. In terms of uh, also uh, issues related to health, uh, here I want to share a research that was done uh, by Professor uh, Judy Kaman from uh, uh, Australia, where she recorded severe inflammation in GM fed on pigs compared to nil inflammation on non-GM fed on pigs. This is a mixture of GMO soya and GMO maize that and uh, you, could, you can see the, the damage that was done on the uterine pathologies of pigs. Humans have a similar digestive uh, track to the pigs. You can see here, uh, this shows, uh, this was uh, nil, uh, non-GMO fed, and this was GMO fed. Uh, one of the examples of uh, uh, some of the issues that we've raised. But uh, one of the major challenges that, that we've raised also about uh, genetic modification is that it's linkage with uh, a lot of increased use of toxic uh, pesticides, herbicides, and insecticides. One of the most controversial being glyphosate, where over 80% of the GM crops grown worldwide are engineered to tolerate herbicide uh, or glyphosate, uh, herbicide tolerant cro uh, crops, so they're, they're known as that Roundup Ready crops. The biggest controversy about glyphosate, and the first time it was discovered it was in 1964, where it was patented as a mineral chelator to clean uh, those uh, metallic pipes, especially in industries. Uh, you remember before we have the we have now mostly plastic pipes. We had the uh, the the metallic ones, which were often got uh, rust, and uh, glyphosate was used to clean. Later in 1974, it was found to be a herbicide and started being used as a herbicide. And later, just recently, 2010, it has been found to be a very effective antibiotic. You and I know that too much use of antibiotics leads to uh, a lot of drug resistance. But also in 2015, the WHO classified glyphosate as a probable carcinogen to humans and a group 2A based on animal studies. Uh, and uh, this is something that's quite worrisome, with especially when you related to the herbicide uh, tolerant or Roundup Ready crops. But also, there have been increasing cases of uh, 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 cancer, uterine cancer, liver, and bile duct cancer. This was a research that was done in 2014, increasing cancer cases, uh, incidences consistent with the increased use of Roundup and the increased use of GMO technologies. And that's one of the issues that uh, as researchers, it would be good to um, do local research studies and uh, learn more about this in Kenya, because a lot of the uh, information we have is coming from uh, researchers from out of the country. Of course, the controversial one, uh, the Jill Seralini study, where rats were fed uh, on uh, uh, GMO maize, uh, GMO uh, maize and developed tumors. The controversial bit was that uh, when uh, Professor Seralini first publishes his studies, the, pub the journal was uh, owned or controlled by um, so-called multinationals, and uh, this caused a lot of heat, and that's the reason why his first study was withdrawn. Subsequently, he repeated the study, and it was published again in another journal, which was independent, and that's where uh, people try to paint a very bad picture and say Sierra Leone's study was not correct. But the truth is that uh, the rats that were fed their whole lives, uh, two years span on uh, the GMOs developed tumors. And you, and you and I know tumor is a sign of something is really wrong and it can be a cause of cancer. 
But one of the most documented researches undertaken uh, was one led by Apad Pushtai on GMO potatoes at the Rowett Institute in the UK. And the primary objective was to develop testing protocols for long-term safety tests for all GMO foods. After 10 days of feeding the rats, developed a uh, uh, potential precancerous cell growth in their digestive tracts and this inhibited development of their brains livers and testicles and enlarged pancreas and immune system damage uh, of course uh, when pushtai published this there was a lot of uh, heat that came up in their university and the institute and even the research team was disbanded politically because of him raising questions about uh, GMO potatoes that were uh, being tested and uh, going public with that information. And some of the findings uh, eventually had to even leave the university. And this fund, some of these findings were published in the Lancet, and this remains the most in-depth GMO feeding study ever published. And so you see a lot of researchers, uh, when they try to go independent and raise some of these concerns, the kind of challenges they face even within their research institutes. Of course, uh, uh, Professor Odor mentioned this morning about the headline on the in the nation newspaper. And uh, I want to take you back 10 years, uh, 12 years ago. This is April 15, 2010. We as the Biodiversity and Biosafety Association of Kenya, then we were known as the Kenya Biodiversity Coalition, which was then a loose coalition, raised a lot of concerns because we came to, to know under the Katagina protocol, the importer and exporter of any GMO crop needs to alert, put up an alert in a national newspaper and alert the, the, the public that we intend to export. So South Africa in this case uh, had uh, the, under their minister and their directorate of agriculture had alerted us or our friends alerted us that uh, South Africa had the intention of exporting 40,000 metric tons of uh, genetically engineered maize from South Africa to Kenya. This particular year was a bumper harvest in Kenya. And so when we came to that, uh, uh, came across that information, we raised a lot of queries. Uh, who has approved this? Then uh, the national, uh, the, our, our biosafety law had just come into place in 2009. The NBA, the National Biosafety Authority was still in its formative stage. So we were questioning, is it, we even put up newspaper adverts. Is it the CAFIS who had approved? Is it CABS? who had approved this uh, importation of GMO maize in a year where we have a bumper harvest. And uh, after a lot of questions, then the Parliamentary Committee on Agriculture was led by Honorable John Mututo. He even went to uh, Mombasa and they did a lot of, uh, they did, they did a, um, a work and were questioning all this. Eventually that report has never come out. We have never received it, but you can see the issues of trade, control of trade, um, Corporate capture did not start now. Uh, it, it has been something that has been uh, a big push and uh, we have raised a lot of concerns about that. When you look at issues related to pest uh, and disease control, the maize tembora causes about 30 to 70% yield loss in maize plants, but we have local uh, solutions. Isipe has developed this push and pull technology, which uh, is a way of controlling the stem borer instead of using lots of, uh, a lot of, uh, instead of introducing GMO maize uh, or BT maize. Uh, here, the maize is planted on these rows. We have desmodium here, uh, which is a repellent, pushes away the stem borer. This is napier grass that grows on the side, has a gum. When they are pushed here, they can, they get stuck on the gum in the, in the leaves. And they and they die off. So you are maize prospers. The the desmodium is also a nitrogen fixation. And also, if you have animals, you are able to feed them on this uh, napier grass. One of the solutions. Uh, BT cotton was uh, introduced uh, in Kenya and uh, has been uh, commercialized uh, through. Even when we had the ban, there was a cabinet decision uh, to introduce it under the uh, pillar. One of the pillars, big four pillars, manufacturing. But uh, when you look at some of the case studies, for example, from Burkina Faso, BT cotton was introduced in 2008, but abandoned in 2016 due to one, the cotton was of inferior quality. Uh, the lint was shorter. Burkina Faso was once a, a, a big exporter of uh, high quality cotton, but the GMO one uh, made them have high losses. 
the, there were higher costs of input. The BT cotton seed was almost 40 times more expensive than the conventional variety. There was increased uh, cost of uh, seeds and a lot of the royalties going into the, to the multinationals. And then the emergency of secondary pests because of more sprays that were used and more spraying was done on the BT cotton. In the India case, Loans that were taken by the farmers could not be serviced due to poor crop yields, leading to farmer suicides. A lot of them were related to issues of farmers could not manage even to service their loans. There were cases of allergies and reactions to chemicals and sprays used in the BT cotton. And there also uh, um, cases of where reports of death of cattle and buffalo uh, feeding on the GMO or the BT cotton straw. We also saw that I had the opportunity to, to go to Burkina Faso and the farmers reported that, but I don't think research was followed up on that, that their, their animals were cattle were dying off after eating the straw. And then the toxins had a lot of effects on the uh, non-target uh, uh, organisms, including mammals. And this is a, a big issue that uh, we have always raised. Uh, the linkage between uh, glyphosate and uh, and uh, and uh, GMOs is uh, very big, and uh, when you look at, for example, the French government case against uh, one of the companies, they declared it as non-biodegradable, and uh, uh, the growth of genetically modified uh, maize or the crops is very much linked to the use of increased use of glyphosate. One of the products is Randa. And then uh, in the US, here I talk about four land, three landmark cases, but now there are about 30,000 cases of uh, people who have sued uh, uh, one of these big major players for developing or producers of Roundup for developing cancer after years of using it uh, without, uh, it was promoted as something you don't need to wear gloves, you can just use it and now they have developed uh, cancer. Uh, even here, just here, our neighbors in the Kilimanjaro area, they are fetching 10 times uh, the, the uh, profit from growth of organic cotton. Some of the countries that have banned uh, GM crops include uh, these that are listed here, and most of the European uh, countries are moving away from GMOs. But let me mention again that uh, GMOs is only one branch of, biote of biotechnology. We are not saying we are against biotechnology. Biotechnology has been used for many years uh, in the production, even in the production of uh, baking, in the production of, for example, our local brews, Muratina and all those, and that we are not against. The only controversial bit is this genetic, genetically engineered crops. Some of the environmental risks include loss of biodiversity, the impact on non-target organisms like butterflies and bees, uh, on the water bodies. In, the, in France, they found that uh, the Bt was uh, in the water uh, wells and others. After many years of using, uh, of using them, they were finding them in their water, uh, water bodies. And so that linkage is very uh, important in terms of research. And that's why we keep on calling on Kenyan researchers can we do local research uh, to ensure that uh, we are checking uh, the impact on Kenyans? BT maize, for example, in the US is grown for animal feed, but here it's going to be consumed almost every on a daily basis. And what will be the impact on our lives? And you know, the generation that makes a decision is not the generation which will suffer. It will, you will not eat ugali at Uhuru Park today, GMO ugali at Uhuru Park today and fall off. It will take time. It does not impact immediately, but slowly. And you will see in the next generations to come uh, the impact of uh, introduction of GMOs. And of course, the issues of uh, cross-pollination uh, coexistence is not possible with GMOs because especially in Kenya, our smallholder farmers cannot even maintain the refugia, which is around the farm to avoid cross-pollination. And this is going to be a big challenge. I have an example here of a Canadian farmer, Percy Schmeiser, who was growing a GMO canola. And uh, when he was growing his GMO canola, his neighbors, no, sorry, he was growing organic canola and his neighbors were growing GMO canola. And so there was cross-pollination. And uh, when the company that uh, was promoting the GMO canola tested his canola, they said, you have our technology, you have to pay for it. He was sued for thousands of uh, dollars. 
uh, he lost the case, but eventually he had he got support and won the case. He was almost going bankrupt. I think he died about two years ago. He's one of the examples about the issues of control, royalties, and he who owns the seed will own the life and the profits. If you look at the issue, uh, um, another example that we have, five years after the GM crops became available for use in Canada, the Canadian Farmers National Farmers Union uh, started lobbying the Canadian federal government to legislate industry compensation for an intended genetic alteration of crops. The members uh, who included both organic and uh, GM farmers uh, decried the issue of genetic pollution that, in, that infringed on the livelihoods of farmers or the general public. And one of the ag agronomists, Anne Clark, from the University of, of Guelph in the province of Ontario, agreed that Kalona, canola pollen can move up to eight kilometers uh, uh, from, and, and for maize, for corn and potatoes up to one kilometer. And this is going to be a big issue that uh, will lead to genetic pollution of, or rather the genetic, lose, us losing our genetic uh, varieties. Um, there's a lot of conflict of interest and on who pays for our research. And one of the arguments that we've always forwarded is that the government of Kenya needs to put more, more money into local research to avoid our researchers accepting money from promoters of this GMO technology and to ensure that they, they, they work objectively because he who will pay the piper, you have to play their tune. And that's uh, one of the issues that we keep on uh, raising. And so uh, just in brief, I've shared that, but uh, we have to continuously ask us who is benefiting from GM crops. For us, it's the multinationals, the big uh, corporations. Uh, it's about trade. You have seen the controversy that has come up uh, with this uh, importation or the lifting, the, the government um, removing the taxes and uh, opening the doors for 10 million bags of GM maize into the country. In previous years, we have always imported non-GMO maize into the country. And so why this? Uh, to the extent some of our leaders are saying that uh, we have just introduced uh, something to kill Kenyans. And you can see it has always been an issue of trade, an issue of corporate control and profits for a few companies and multinationals. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm sure we'll have some questions later. Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Maina. Certainly a very insightful uh, presentation, very well researched, very uh, representative of diverse crops and countries with a historical perspective. Yes, and indeed you have said you are not against biotech. There are specific issues that you are raising there. So with great appreciation, I know there are a couple of questions that have been uh, uh, presented in the chat box. Please continue posting the questions. And as we continue to the next presenter, uh, Ms. Kina, you could be uh, looking through and we'll come to that uh, after the other presenter. So allow me now to introduce our next presenter. That will be uh, Professor Richard Odur. And uh, Professor Odur, you can be projecting your presentation as I introduce you. So Professor Richard uh, Odur is an Associate Professor of Molecular Biology. He works in Kenyatta University in the Department of Biochemistry, Microbiology and Biotechnology. He conducts research widely. In modern biotechnologies, including the you know, as drought aflatoxin striker. He is an accomplished researcher and he holds a patent in the science uh, of uh, biotechnology. He serves in several boards. He chairs, first of all, the University Biotechnology Consortium. This is a professional body in Kenya, including both public and private universities. He serves in the Global uh, Biotechnology Board on Transfer Foundation. In the UK, he's a member of the Kenya National Bureau of Statistics. He has been fettered and recognized nationally and globally, including by South Africa. He has served as a director for research support here at the university prior to his recent appointment as acting registrar for research. And his training is in the University of Cape Town in molecular and cell biology, uh, building on his prior training at masters and BSc levels in biotechnology at Kenyatta University. 
He is widely recognized for his accomplishments in research and in leadership. And I welcome Professor Richard O'Doul to provide further insights on this topic. Welcome, Professor. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Prof. Maina. Uh, am I audible enough? Yes, you are. You are. You can go ahead. My slide up there as well. Y your slide is there, yes. Right. I, I think I, I uh, for purposes of, of ensuring that we get this to the end, uh, if you allow me to mute the, the video so that I'm able to uh, we get this sorted. I really appreciate. Is that in order, Prof? That is okay. That is okay. Yes, you can go ahead. All right. So as um, as you have rightfully indicated, I just want to say uh, very uh, quickly that uh, this is a very interesting, very interesting area that is very almost personal, and I like it. But what I want to say here very quickly is to appreciate this man. His name is Isaac Newton. There is one thing he said, and his third law of motion, and particularly those uh, people who are good in physics will tell you that action, uh, every action has a reaction equal in magnitude and opposite in direction. Simply when we were in high school, we used to say that um, action and reaction are equal and opposite. That was the, uh, you know, the basic thinking of it. And the reason why I'm showing the face of this man here is because in the world, there is everything. For instance, right now, as we are claiming or complaining about hunger, there is a child somewhere and people somewhere that are having a lot more food to eat. At the same time, we are undergoing very crazy drought. But I can tell you there are other animals in other parts of this world that are really, really enjoying abundance. Similarly, if you look at the drown as it is, and even in the very, very Africa, we have been having floods in Nigeria, just here in Africa. And that therefore tells you a lot more things, that when we have drought that is killing other, other, uh, other crops that we rely on, like maize, if the drought comes like what it is now, we cannot survive. But at the same time, it is good to note that there are other grasses that are uh, you know, called resurrection plants that are able to grow on the rocks and their grass. Maize and grass are the same one box. Then you start asking yourself a question. Why can't we eat the grass? What is in this grass that is making it survive that level of drought and maize cannot do? So when you go further, you look at nutrients, like if you talk, uh, look at maize, um, rice, for instance, it only gives you carbohydrates while you need beans to give you proteins. So we look at it and say, all right, this is what well, the world has given us. We are talking about striga, the same, same nature. It gives you maize, but gives you straga to feed on your maize. It gives you potato, but gives you insects to feed on that particular um, source of food. At the same time, it gives you other things, but gives you also disease at the same time. Now, when you proceed, you continue to still fumble in the world because we have to leave. You look at maize, it was just fine. Then something pops up called aflatoxin. We have to deal with it. Maize lethal necrotic disease, this cleared everything recently in this country, and we the memory is still very clear. If you look at, for instance, soybean, on the right side, you will see the pests. Look at the cotton that we require for many things, animal feed, and even for the fiber, which is for the textile industries. On the right, you will see, again, certain pests. Look at cassava, for instance. These are the food, and I liked it when Anne said that we are overly dependent on maize. And you see, there is no ban on cassava or even sweet potato. So our dependence on maize is another thing that can be explained through socioeconomic platforms and even just preference. So that is a different discussion. But when you look at that, you realize that the cassava itself has cyanide and we are not, it's not lost on us that we've lost kids and many people when they eat cassava that have got iron and cyanide. But luckily, there are technologies that are able to lower this, including here at Kenyatta University that we are using. So the challenge that we are having as a country, I looked at the, you know, the current, you know, it is just some minutes um, past 10.30, and I looked at the current world population, and it was at 8 billion. And people from midnight to now, we have 159 people born. And those who have died between that time up to now are 80,000. So we are clearly talking about almost around 70 or so, uh, or, or, or 80 
you know, population increase. While this is happening, there is climate change. And we are big in this as a country and the world. They are actually, if you're following the discussions that have been happening in Egypt, you will be amazed that they are, they are at least accepting that probably the people who caused a lot of you know, climate change must now start compensating those who are suffering because of it. But at the same time, we are saying that with that actually, coupled with the fact that in Africa, 65% of the labor market depends on agriculture. And if you also realize that the farmers, real farmers are also aging, and the youth that are supposed to inherit agriculture are actually looking for white collar job. They want to tweet seeds and hashtag fertilizers and like probably weeding and seed and all that. You know, that's the kind of constraints that we are suffering from. And with that, if you merge that with the kind of emerging trends in the farming system, right from the whole bit of it to the last picture there, where now we are using a lot of mechanization. Whereas we have a lot of tractors, we have all these things happening. If you don't get the right seed that has got the right protection or tolerance, you are still struggling. Because it doesn't matter whether you plowed using a tractor. It doesn't matter whether you added a lot of fertilizers or even you irrigated it. If the seed is palatable to an insect, it will enjoy that seed regardless of irrigation. So our thinking as researchers is where now we come in and say, yes, we are biotechnologists. What is biotechnology really? And if you look at that, you will um, realize that indeed biotechnology is just a, a technology that uses living organism or substances from living organisms um, with a view to actually making or you know products to improve plants or animals. And this is done for a specific function or a specific use. Now, this is where now we come in, because the whole discussion, anytime somebody talks about GMO, you start feeling like you are really dead. And sometimes I wonder why. Because if you look at a cell, and I'm privileged to show you one in there, uh, before we used to think that the cell was the smallest thing until electron microscope and other microscopes popped in and people realized that ah, we have organelles and ah, we have a nucleus and now we have DNA. And soon you'll realize that DNA is not the last thing. You will realize there are other more important, you know, smaller things that are better than the DNA. But this is that one we leave for the future. Now, inside the nucleus, and this is where the GMO uh, starts coming in, inside the nucleus, and this is the basic understanding. And if we can get this all through this presentation, I will just pack and leave. That within the nuclear, we have two things, or just one thing called nucleic acid. But those nucleic acids have the DNA and RNA, depending on which genome you are talking about. But probably what is more important for us to appreciate good people is that anything that you see alive has only four letters in the genome. It has a T, it could be an a, a, G, and C. Those are the only four nucleotides that exist in anything alive, be it a plant, be it a bacteria, be it a virus. Those are the only four. That T sometimes changes with you, but it's the same thing. And I don't want to go to that T and U bit. Just know for now, for sake of this discussion, that the genome has only four letters that repeat themselves differently. Now, then, if you look at the pictures that I have given, you will see others are chameleon, others are penguins, others are horses, others are elephant. Then you might ask a question. If it is true, they only have four letters that, you know, how come that we have elephants and we are different from mango trees, which are also living and everything else? The difference is that that ATGC repeats itself in the genome several times in different sequences, but they are all those four. For instance, in a human being, those letters A, T, G, C have repeated themselves in a particular sequence 3.2 billion times. 3.2 billion times. Others will be a million, others will be 2 million, others will be a billion, and that is what brings now this difference. And for simplistic reasons, I want you to look at the alphabets that we have. There are only 26. This is an analogy so that we break this size down for people to understand it, because this technology has been here for the last uh, 40 years. And therefore, when I see people still arguing as if this is a cutting edge technology, they are just making us look smart unnecessarily. And we don't like it as scientists. 
All we are saying is we have alphabets and they are 26. Let's assume, because the whole idea here is about breaking it down so that we all understand. Let's assume you want to write your name. If your name is Alex, like Professor Machocho, for instance, he will go into the genome or, or into the alphabet now. He will pick an A, will go to where L is, he will look at where E is, and will look where X is. And out of that, he picks a name called Alex. Because it is sequence. These are 26, we all know. Then if your name is Richard as myself, I will go in there and pick an R, an I, a C, and all, and I will pop up with a name called Richard. If there is another lady called Jane, she will look for the J and everything else. Now, when you go ahead and make a Richard and make an Alex and make a Jane, you cannot actually, assuming we want now a George, you cannot come and say, let's pick Richard and Jane to get a George. And that is what we are calling species barrier. That all of us that are alive and insects and everything else that is alive draws their default setting from the four letters that we talked about and in a sequence that is actually unique and known. The lack is you cannot start doing genetic engineering before sequencing. And this is important because how will you pick? How you know I've picked a J and a, you know an A for Jane because I know where J is, and because I also know that I want to make a Jane. That's why I picked a J and not a K. In genetic engineering, what is done is that before you think about anything that you want to do, you must get to know what is it and what is the section of the DNA that is dependent to this. And that is what you pick. So for instance, the same letters can be used to write a letter. And that letter can have two methods, uh, two impacts. The letter could be a promotion letter, and therefore you will see people are celebrating. Or the letter could be a sucking letter, and you can see what is happening. Meaning the impact of those alphabets can be jubilation, or it can also be sorrow. But the letters are the same. And that is why we keep saying that the role of genetic, the genetic engineering must be regulated so that we get to know what was the original intention and what has it been used for. And this is just a snapshot of what happened. So you have your DNA that is transcribed into something we are calling messenger RNA, and messenger RNA eventually gives you the protein. And I don't want to go deep in science because we will have a session for it. Now, there is a thing that is important for people to understand, and it is called a central dogma. Central dogma is that cascade of things that start from DNA to the final trait that you are seeing. And I want to equate it with the analogy down there. You know, when you have a CD to play some gospel music, for instance, that CD is nothing if you don't have a, a radio cassette to interpret it. Even however close you can put that CD on your ears, it, would, it, would, it will not sing. But when you put it into a radio or your stereo, the stereo has the capacity to interpret the content within that CD to give you music. Then at the same time, remember you picked a CD and you wanted gospel. If you put the gospel into that CD and it gives you music and you find it is reggae, where do you go? You realize you either, you cannot start complaining that it is your stereotype, you know, your radio that is giving you reggae. You go back to the default setting, which is the CD. Which CD did I pick? And that is what happens with genetic engineering. When the CD is scratched and you copy it, it goes with that scratch. And that is what we are saying. Genetic engineering also, once you put it in there nicely, we monitor it back. And the, the final thing which is dancing is now the trait. And that is the central dogma that when you see the DNA understood by it reads within the transcription, messenger RNA gives you a protein and a protein gives you the trait, which is now the music. That is what we have allayed there. Now, this is the big thing around biotechnology that it is not new. And when Anne was saying that this thing has been here for years, it is true. Because when you talk about any person who is out there who has diabetes, is enjoying GMO insulin. Before, we used to purify insulin from pigs. And you can imagine what that meant. You have to kill pigs to get insulin. And then we have to actually, Muslims cannot touch it. They would rather die with your insulin from pig. 
And therefore, scientists looked back and said, okay, we are here. What do we do? They went and looked at the person, just a genome of a person who has a working insulin, and then cut it and placed it in the genome of E. coli, which is a normal flora in our stomachs, so that the normal flora, which is the bacteria in a bioreactor, can now start secreting, you know, producing for you insulin, which we can purify. And then we use. That is what we are using now. World over, there is no any non-GMO. There is no non-GMO um, insulin world over. It is the same thing recently you had around the message, you know, the vaccine during Corona. It was MRA, you know, you know, uh, vaccines. That is still the same GMO. And we all, most of us went for it. When you look at Gusha's disease, we express it in transgenic carrot cells. When you look at so many of these cancer cells, we are interferons and we are using this technology, including gene therapy. It is of fine. But it is very surprising that when we go to make it for food, then you hear sentiments like you see the foods that we are eating. It is not like the drugs because the drugs, um, food we eat every day. I want to challenge all of us and we must be fair to ourselves. We have been eating ugali for ever since we were born. Have you ever woken up with leaves of, you know, maize on your ears? What happened to that DNA? What really happened when you eat beef? and they have cows have horns. Why don't we wake up with horns because we have eaten this DNA? And do we separate them when you eat? Do you go in there to remove the DNA? And therefore, when we are moving the DNA from one source to another, which you naturally eat them from those sources, you start saying that there is chemicals. There is a reason why it is GMO and not CMO, chemically modified organisms, because chemicals are chemicals. We don't need to go through these 15 years in the lab to create a chemical, really. We just add it, if that is what has to be done. And we must be fair to ourselves. Now, countries that have accepted GMO must have certain aspects. A country must have human capacity. A country must have a regulatory agency. The, in this country, Kenya, we even have appeals board. We must have government goodwill, and we must have research capacities. And these are the four things, five things, that I want to highlight to you how ready we are as a country so that we appreciate this science. For instance, if you look at regulatory, we have National Biosafety Authority, and Dr. Roy Mugira is here, and he will talk about NBA deeper than I can do, and I can't even purport to be better in this regard. But something else I want to just tell you about National Biosafety Authority, from my own point of view, this is the only regulatory agency which was established 12 years ago from since 2010, following an act of parliament, and Dr. Mugira will talk about it that since its inception to date, the CEOs all have PhDs. The first one was Willie Tono. The second one was Professor you know, Dorington Ogori. And his director technical was Professor Muthui, who is now the CEO of Kefis. And the third one, who is now Roy Mugira, and he is here with us, is a PhD holder. Very competent people in this regard. And probably the only organization of parastatal in this country that has given us this kind of trend. And all the biosafety officers have master's degrees and above, and many of them are PhD students. That is to tell you that the government is very particular about this technology. And also for our knowledge, please understand that when a government decides to have a regulatory authority, it means that it has already agreed in principle that this is a good technology that we only need to regulate. There is a reason why we don't have cocaine regulatory authority, because cocaine is banned. You cannot ban something, and we have universities that are offering biotechnology courses, and you have many of us who are teaching in the university doing genetic engineering and paid salary. So let's appreciate, first of all, the kind of scenario where we are. We have students who are doing biotech courses and PhDs, and we have helped, you know, used government funding to actually even train these students. So let's, let, let, let's understand. And apart from that, if there is need for experts, NBA has a list, and this is usually on all the papers, experts to come and help in case there is need for agency. And Dr. You know, CEO will talk about this. It's not in my place. So in terms of regulation, we are good. In terms of institutions, you know, laboratories that are able in the country to do this research, there is Kenyatta University. There is uh, Kenyatta University, there is uh, Il Rebecca, there is Calro, and there is also ECP. These are four labs that are competent 
to do this work and they are doing it in this country. And soon I'll talk about, very shortly, I'll talk about uh, Kenyatta University and for the 17 years that we have been doing this work here in the country. Now, in, in, in Becca, we have cassava, bananas, and plantains that are undergoing genetic engineering so that we understand that things are happening locally as well, so that we stop this um, sometimes argument that we are just this technology is Western. It's not. We, we, we see these genes here. There is uh, ECP, Drosophila, and this is now looking at animals. And there's a lot more of work that has happened in Ilri around having hornless you know, cows, because the cows use their horns just to hit others and kill others. And therefore, we don't eat the horns at the same time. So you just can RNA silence that so that your cow, instead of developing long horns, that energy is utilized to make meat. And that is a discussion for another day. Now we have Calro that has done a lot of research as well in this regard, and they have more research happening even now. And I'm happy that uh, Anne talked about even Tella and all those kind of things that are happening at Calro. We have BT Cotton, which is um, actually has is uh, is already commercialized and it's out there. Uh, only that the bulking of the seeds that is happening and the importation of the same will happen. But this is a technology that is here, and we were given as a country royalty free. The BT cotton you are hearing that our farmers are going to plant is royalty free. You will not be charged for the royalty. And the discussion about who owns the technology, and I will be very happy to respond to that shortly on your time. Now, we have a lot more work happening with cassava, cassava brown stick and cassava mosaic. And here, Professor M M you know, Miano of University of Nairobi is leading, and this is reducing the problems with the viruses for our cassava, so that at least Anne would look at it and say that we are not overly depending on maize, so we can do a bit of cassava, we do a bit of sweet potato as well. And I agree. Sebi, in University of Nairobi, a lot of things are happening. Remember, if any other person wants to do genetic engineering in the country, they are allowed to either do it at Kenyatta University, Isipe, you can do it at Becker or at Calro. This, and therefore, a lot of work is happening. Even much as these universities don't have that biosafety level too accredited by NBA, but it is important that when they want to do, because there are so many experts in those universities that are working at Kenyatta University or Calro or ECP or all these places. In JQuad, for instance, where the tissue culture is a big deal, and the tissue culture is a very critical uh, you know, stage in genetic engineering, because once you have moved the gene, you need to regenerate it to whole organism, um, and then you require tissue culture, and that is why it's a critical component. Now, let me just show you briefly around Kenyatta University. In Kenyatta University, this lab, which I did my master's in, and I participated, I've doing, been doing research and, uh, you know, in this lab for, for years before becoming a director of research now, um, and, and in my current role, we have a lot of local content that is happening in this lab. And what I want you to see is just, just look at the list of the kind of crops that we have genetically uh, succeeded in genetic engineering to actually um, improve in one trait or another. And uh, I, I will talk shortly about them, but not deeply. And we look at the biotic and the biotic constraints. Biotic are the things like diseases, insects, and weeds, and the biotics, things like drought, salinity, cyanide, and many others. Now, and the genes that we have used over the years, okay, and I will explain when during the question time, probably so that I unpack it even further, um, are many. But listen to this particular aspect of things. And I'm very deliberate here. Those three faces that you are seeing in that particular slide, the first one is a Tanzanian. That was my PhD student. The second one is later, PhD student. And the third one is Russia. So the first one from Tanzania, the second one from Ethiopia, the third one is from Sudan. These students came to this lab here at Kenyatta University, trained them, that developed transgenic maize, and they left with their good seeds. While in this country from 2012, we have been having a ban while we are training for the region and beyond. Now, if you look at us locally, we have Dr. Jonathan, that's a Kenyan, who actually did his research here and using clean gene technology, where you are actually removing the gene of interest that you have put in, particularly the selectable markers, double tDNA. He used it here in this lab. We have Dr. and he was in a lecture of Moy. Uh, we have Eric Kuria. This uh, for during his master's, he was working on drought tolerance. He's now he got his PhD and now is actually in Chuka University here. We are talking about Alan and we lost him uh, earlier on to, 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 you know, but he was working on aptamas, which is just more or less like generating antibodies uh, for, for, for the maze. And this is the simplistic bit of it. If we give 
birth to kids and we take kids for immunization? Is it because we usually you know, think that God never completed the work? Why do we take our kids for immunization? And if we are able and comfortable with injecting ourselves with the vaccines for purposes of protecting ourselves against polio, measles, and why do we think we can't protect maize against insects? And it becomes a big deal, but we are fine with our kids being vaccinated. You know, we must get to a point where we become, you know, receptive to some of these technologies. And I will unpack it further. Now, you look at Joel Masanga, who was a PhD student here, masters with us in the lab here, was looking at the aflatoxin. And this is what nature has taught us. You see, aflatoxin that is coming from the fungi, A flowers, does not know, you know, it's a mechanism for them to survive and colonize an area. Just the very way, you know, antibiotics was actually discovered. So when this fungi produces these toxins that we eventually call the aflatoxin star, it's because it's trying to defend its food and colony. And because it is something that is living, we just go into its genome and say, those four letters that we talked about, which one is responsible for producing toxins? That is the only thing that we silence so that, <laughs> so, so that it does not produce that particular toxin. This is, and you can't do it naturally. You must go back to the genome and the sequences are there. This student here is supposed to graduate in the upcoming actually graduation, which is happening next month in this university, but has left the university for postdoc in Virginia. Postdoc trained here in Kenya and has left the country in June to go and do a postdoc. That is how clear, how competent this technology, we know it to the point that we are now shipping into the UK, to the US to go do it for them when we are here. So it's, 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 we are not lesser scientists. We have interacted with this technology and we know how it works. Look at Wilton, Wilton Binder. He's a lecturer at, at a senior lecturer at Kwani. You see, this work was funded by Nakosti, now NRF. And look at Zaro, Dr. Mackenzie, he's in Tum. These are lecturers in this university, in the, the, our university's local. And what was this? Uh, Wilton was working on sweet potato and making it drought tolerant by Kenyan funding. So when Anne is talking about who is funding, it is fine. But I also want to challenge that particular content and say that even this kind, there is nothing wrong with getting donor funding. Even this very, very country is getting donor funding. If a country can do it, why does it become special that a scientist shouldn't get funding from, from donors, really? We must speak to the science. It's not the money. The science, is it safe and is it good for us? And the moment we go that direction, we will be making a step. Go further to probably look at the, this is Eric again, but now Stryker. This country, we have a big guru called Professor Stephen Bruno, who can tell you anything you want on Stryker, wildly recognized. You know, and this man has been overseeing a lot of good research, including these other things, because the beauty with this technology is that once you know it, you know it, and it is transformable. That does not mean that he is not an expert on this other aspect, but he has chosen Stryker and he's doing a thorough job in it. So Steve has been actually working on, on this Stryker for years and doing great work in this. This is a Kenyan working here as a university professor in this very, very university and a colleague in the department. What we are trying to say, look at Neondo, for instance. This is Dr. Neondo, he's a JQuat employee lecturer, was working on the you know, purple acid phosphatase. How do we reduce striga from attach, attaching itself to the roots of maize? We are looking at, the, at uh, Dr. Matthew, he's the chair of the biochemistry department. He is the man who actually looked at the cyanide, this thing that kills kids, and looked at it and said, why is cassava producing cyanide and we want to eat it? And when we eat it with cyanide, it kills us. What did he do? Looked at the sequence of cassava and then identified that the production of cyanide in cassava is actually a defense mechanism so that you don't eat cassava. It's a survival for the fetus. So what do we do? We go in there and realize that cyanide is a product of a pathway called the nanomerine pathway. And you only silence that particular gene that encodes for that enzyme so that your cassava is still fine. You reduce cyanide in it. And some of these ladies have been doing this. These are four other ladies. Two of them are now PhD holders. And, and, and this is the kind of discussion we are talking about in this very, very country. So a lot is happening in the country. We have a lot of cassava happening, maize happening, uh, cotton happening. And these things have been here for the last several years. In Africa, and this is just um, uh, to move a little faster. When you hear people saying, why is Kenya in the rush? 
Kenya is not on the rush. South Africa, where most of us, uh, you know, also would want to go and see a thing or two, adopted this technology in 1998. 1998. They have been eating GM, have been planting it, and I studied at the University of Cape Town, ate that GMO, and therefore, if there is any futuristic thing, start monitoring me, you know, and I'm still here, and many of us who are in South Africa. In South Africa, there is Malawi, and there is Eswatini. Those are three countries in the southern part. In, Af in East Africa, we have now Kenya, Ethiopia, and Sudan. In West Africa, we have Nigeria and Ghana. And if Nigeria, by the way, for the information, Nigeria almost accounts for, four, for a quarter, you know, uh, you know, 25 percent of the African population. So one in four should be a Nigerian and they are eating it. Now, there was a Burkina Faso and that probably I will talk about that later on, because um, this, how did the cotton bit of it happen? And I will just want to give this analogy that, for instance, if you are a, a short lady and you want long hair, I will go and pick a gene from a lady who is tall and give it, you know, with long hair. That's the gene that I put in you so that you have your long hair. But if you get your long hair and you start saying, but I'm not tall, then I ask you, no, 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 you were talking about long hair. If you wanted tallness, then I needed to pick two genes, one for the long hair and one for tallness. This is what happens with Burkina Faso. The background, it was a technology, the background that the, D, the, you know, the, 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 the GMO was done, and this, well, Mugira will let you understand, was a wrong background. And a lot of things are happening around that to just correct that. That's just a breeding thing. It's not a GMO thing. But that's a discussion that we can also talk about later. Now, if it is true, the discussion that I have given you is the positive position of this. Sometimes I ask myself, how did we get here as a country that we are talking up to now of a technology that is 40 years old? Because for the 26 years that GMO has been commercialized, you need 15 years to develop it in the lab. So if you add those two, we are talking about 40 years of a technology. And we are here debating it as if it is very new. And we need actually to watch this thing happening. How did we get here just like this, this particular photo? Was it the KPLC or the house? Who was here first and how did this photo happen? That is the kind of conundrum that I keep asking myself all the time I hear discussions around GMO. And you know what I've realized? It is because us, the scientists ourselves, probably have not spoken very well. Because the anti-GMOs have beaten us in this game in terms of communication. And I admit, because the first thing they will tell you, they'll show you a photo like that and tell you, hey, GMO, they are injecting things. I want to tell you that there is nowhere world over where GMO is made like this. Nowhere. And if it was this easy, I can tell you when you eat maize, you will grow maize in your ears. If this is how GMO genes move. And therefore, if you go walking on a banana plantation, you will come back when you are green because the DNA has moved. This doesn't exist. I have never seen this anywhere. And there is no world of, and I'm waiting for a publication in this regard. There is none. This is what you see out there, the anti-GMO saying, that these GMO guys are crazy people. They will actually change the shapes of the things. Strawberries will be coming on cuboid, you know, shapes. This is very bad. And you, and, and, and I can tell you, the kind of gene, genetic engineering that you will require to change this shape will require hundreds of it. And why would I go for such a thing? While these shapes, when you are eating, <laughs> when you are eating your strawberry, some of them are take this shape as you crush it in your mouth. Is it trending? It is not. We are actually, this is a, a third other photo that the anti-GMO will tell you that, look, these GMO things, they can look very nice outside, but inside they are crying. Look at that kind of dis display of design, looking very nice. And it communicates. Then they will show you photos and tell you like, look, when you eat GMO, you get cancer. And this is thing, something I pulled from the Saralini paper that Anne referred to. And, uh, and, uh, and, and I just wanna, I will have a lot of things to say about the Saralini paper uh, because it was retracted. And when it was republished and she said that it was republished, I wish she was uh, fair enough to also project the second page of that republished paper. And if she wants, I have it here, I can also project. And it says very well that the reason for actually republishing this is to is not to hide, but to allow discussions around controversies of methodologies. Meaning it is for archival reason, let it not be lost on people that, on how to do bad research. Because the reason why this paper was retracted 
is very clear. It he used first of all the rats that are already that are already um uh, that are already um predisposed to 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 um cancer. You know, if you do, and my postdoc was a drug discovery in Pfizer, so I have a fair understanding of how drug discovery is happening. If I want to test a drug that I'm making for cancer, I must actually have a rat that is already predisposed to cancer so that as I continue injecting it with different dosages of my drug, we see whether it is inhibiting the natural occurrence of it forming cancer. These rats, even if they were fed on water, they were still going to have these cancers, these tumors. But apart from that, there are many studies. It was just restructing a paper is not something that you say that a, a journal actually was owned by the people who are for the technology. No, it doesn't work like that. And we people who are in science understand that when your paper is retracted, then you must appreciate, you must know that um, there's something wrong with it. And the methodology was wrong. There were international organizations that discussed this and many other things. So the question, the things you will hear a lot more is that um, GMOs cause cancer. And let me tell you, I like the choice when they talk about the diseases. You know, a mutation can also cause diabetes. But because cancer is the most trendy and people fear it, that is the right word to run away with. Genetic mutation, if genetic engineering was, that be, was supposed to be that, it should cause even these other things like mm -hmm. diabetes. But diabetes, because it doesn't look serious, mm -mm, that's not good. The seeds, GMO seeds do not germinate. I'm so glad that at least today, Anne was uh, very fair with me and did not do the generation of the seeds because that is something I hear a lot more. And I want to tell them, bring those GMOs we plant them. There is a UN moratorium. There is no terminator gene being used on these things. GMO will cause impotence so that people don't give up. Those are statements that are very specifically made for purposes of scaring. It will cause infertility. You know, it will destroy that biodiversity. And I have a reason, and this probably during the question and answer point, allow me to unpack this biodiversity bit. Multinationals that are running with it, let me tell you, we are actually being taken for a ride. Most of the drugs that we are taking in this country, we don't own their technologies. But as a government, what we need to do, we don't want to inhibit it. You cannot, there's no country world over that has enough innovations. Countries depend on innovations from different countries. What you do as a country is now to say, we want this, your technology. How do we get it as a government? Okay, and then it works. But the reason why this is not happening a lot more is because this technology is being judged. You mentioned GMO, they tell you it is bad. Just like probably some of you have already judged this. You know, this is a family photo. This is a very happy family. They're really enjoying their life. But when you look at it right now, you're almost saying that, how did this lady get convinced? Because you are not seeing anything good around this photo. And how did this man do it? It is because the technology of GMO is overly judged. And we all we see is just risks. Like now you only see the risks. But I can tell you, that's not risky. It's just a, you know, it's just the same photo that has been put the other way around. So when you see the real photo, you will realize that we were fearing nothing, really. And we were, it was just in our mind. If you look at the fear of innovation, anything new must attract a discussion. For instance, this guy, you would imagine that uh, he might not survive in my village because how has he done his hair to get a, you know, a, you know, a cap? This is superstition. This is not acceptable. But if you look at it and look at it as innovation, you realize that this guy will not spend anything on the cap. And therefore, it's an innovation. Let's not fear GMO because it is new. Let's look at it in terms of the merits. And be sure that GMO uh, and this technology has far reaching expectations. And if we given time, you will realize that um, we are in a position to really save this country and this world with a lot more new things. We need to be there to stop this fire. Some person needs to step back and say that, look, this is the discussion that is ongoing, but I choose to be a little rational in my uh, discussion. And of course, we know we will be labeled that we are getting funding from probably donors and everything. But the fact is that it's a good technology. So don't fear. If you believe in the technology, go out there. And that is what we are telling scientists who are in this particular uh, particular um, science, that just face the bull by, you know, by the horns. And also most important, and this is a critical statement, and I'm, I only have a slide or two and then I'm done. This if you listen very carefully to how this question is turning out, you will realize that Africa and ourselves, we are on our own. A question was asked by this person and said, what is your opinion on the shortage of food in the rest of the world? 
what Arabia, Arabia is the first one on the right, is saying what is opinion, meaning their concern is not food. Their concern, what is the opinion? The Americans were asking, what is the rest of, who is this, what's the rest of the world? You see? And of course, EU was saying, what is shortage? And Anne was talking about the EU importing GM for animal feed. And then who eats the animal? Or did the DNA die when it went into the animals? Then in Africa, we also have a concern. We are also asking, what is food? Because that is what we are lacking. What it means, good people, is that let's stop for a moment and understand what is the kind of GMO that we want, for what reason, and for what particular um, uh, purpose. And that is why I'm changing this narrative from GMO to, oh my God, just read that GMO from the back and you will appreciate what I'm talking about. Otherwise, as we continue discussing, hunger, climate change will hit us so bad and in very painful places that we will be left here struggling. Allow me to say that may the anti-GMO be confused, just as they are. And they don't know whether the car is moving, going back or whatever. But this is my hope that we allow the technology to continue. And this is just my university. And I would want to appreciate and say thank you so much. And I know I took a little bit longer, but it is because we have to unpack the technology. Thank you so much, Professor. Right. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Professor Odur. Actually, we started by introducing you as an accomplished uh, researcher and, and a leader, and now we see that you also have a, a great sense of humor, and that's also very insightful. So thank you so much. In the interest of time, please allow me to introduce our next speaker, that is uh, uh, Dr. Roy Mugera. Uh, I don't know whether Dr. Roy has something to present. If you have, you can be uploading it. I have a few slides, uh, Prof. I need to be uh, given uh, uh, authority to share. Okay. Right. You cannot so, start so, and share. Uh -huh. okay. So you'll be enabled as I introduce you. So Dr. Roy Mugera is the Executive Director of the National Biosafety Authority. And uh, the previous speaker, Richard, has mentioned quite some bit about it. He has been, uh, he has worked with various organizations before ascending to his current position. He has formerly worked with the National Commission for Science, Technology and Innovation. He has uh, worked as the director of scheduled sciences there. Previously, he worked with the Ministry of Higher Education, Science and Technology. And he has been with the uh, working with the Kenya Biotechnology Development Policy and Biosafety Regulatory Framework for really many years. His training is in plant viruses in the area of recombinant DNA, in cloning DNA, gene silencing, and functional genomics. And these really are the core disciplines at the center of genetic engineering. And quite clearly, he's an accomplished person. He has good understanding of the policy and regulatory environment. And we are pleased to have you, Dr. Mugera, speaking to us today. You are welcome. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, Prof. And thank you, colleagues and Professor Duol, for making it easier for me. Um, <clears throat> I have picked a number of um, comments online, one by Nyamache. He says uh, this is one of those endless kind of uh, debates. I have also picked from one, one from Mudama. He is uh, focused on science is fun, and he's also advising on science communication, which I agree with. I've also picked one by Mugo, emphasizing on uh, science communication 001 or 11, the, the, the first uh, courses that uh, is required for us. And as, I've also picked from Kibiegon, who is advocating that we apply this fasting and food material so that uh, we can have cash that can be used to buy food and build dams and on and on and on. Thank you once again for uh, bringing me into this. I have been shy to engage in debates. I have been in debates quite a number of times. I am happy to join uh, Professor Duol and Anne. We were together in a bench that was smoking GMO uh, in JKL, Jeff Koinange Live in Citizen TV. And we want to proceed with this uh, conversation. I didn't expect that we shall have long presentations, but I want to rush through my presentation because I want to highlight the framework that we have in place in Kenya for the regulatory regulation of uh, genetically modified organisms. 
Um, the question is, is Kenya ready for GMOs? And uh, uh, I will need to be assisted to move the slides. Uh, Professor uh, Facilitator, my slides are not moving. Okay, um, let's see who is from the technical side. Are you controlling the, the slides yourselves? Yes. Right. From the technical team, somebody can help uh, Dr. Mogera to sort out the issue. Dr. Mogera, try and move your cursor and try and now click. Um, yes, yes. Uh, thank you. Thank you once again. <clears throat> I, I intended to uh, do my uh, presentation by just sharing one slide. And this is the slide. The question is, uh, is Kenya ready? We got ready in 2000 when we appended signature to the Katayana Protocol on biosafety, the protocol that governs the global conduct of business in genetically modified organisms. And here in this picture, we see uh, the late retired president, Daniel Alap Moy, uh, appending his signature so that Kenya becomes party uh, to that protocol. Again, a demonstration of Kenya's commitment to the global governance of modern biotechnology and biodiversity conservation. Kenya was actually the first country to append signature to this protocol and to become a state party when it was uh, uh, commissioned in 2003. Um, before this, the global community had mm -hmm. negotiated the protocol under the Convention on Biological Diversity. So uh, in terms of getting ready, we started getting ready way before 2000. And this is the framework that came for the global governance. And then mm -hmm. we later mm -hmm. developed our own, um, own, own regulatory framework. Uh, there is a pen that is... Um, uh, interfering with my view of the slides, but I hope I can put it somewhere up there. Yes, uh, the second, the third uh, point that this slide shows is our aspiration as a country to become a key participant in the global biotechnology enterprise. We cannot be uh, left behind. We cannot as, uh, close our eyes and say nothing is happening. We, we desired, and this is captured in our national biotechnology development policy, that was published in 2006. Uh, 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 good. Now, after the global arena, we came home and developed the National Biotechnology Development Policy in 2006, enacted the Biosafety Act in 2009, and set up the National Biosafety Authority in 2010. Uh, following that, we published four sets of regulations one to govern contained use of GMOs, uh, that is in the lab and, uh, and field trials and confined areas. Two on uh, export, import and transit. Uh, three on environmental release, if material is going to be grown in our environment. And four on labeling. Uh, all these, uh, the first three happened in 2011 and the fourth one happened in 2012, shortly before the ban uh, that was instituted in 2012. So the purpose of the act as captured in the text document is to regulate activities in GMOs and to establish the National Biosafety Authority and other related uh, purposes. And the objective for which the NBA is established, which I need um, colleagues here to uh, note is to exercise general supervision and control over the transfer, handling and use of genetically modified organisms with a view to ensuring safety of human and animal health and the provision of an adequate level of protection of the environment. I have had uh, questions, I've seen some online relating to safety, relating to the effect on the environment. And I have had quite a bit of presentation by Anne on aspect of socioeconomics. We also consider that when we are uh, approving uh, any project on uh, GM uh, technology. Uh, as a regulator, we do not work alone. We work with uh, eight other regulatory agencies that are clearly identified in the law with their respective mandates. NEMA with the environment mandate, PCPB, this is a pesticide uh, control products board uh, with, uh, with mandate within that space, 
KWS, if material is within um, a Ramsar Convention, protected organisms. We also work with KIPI uh, to reflect on aspects of intellectual property. And uh, we work with KEFIS, of course, this is our greatest partner so far because a lot of what we have dealt with is in the plant space. And uh, again, KEF is looking at the health and the phytosanitary issues, variety registration and release. We also work with KEBS, again, for setting up standards, including standards on labeling and uh, Department of Veterinary Science uh, Services, basically to look at aspects of animal health. And then obviously Department of Public Health to look at uh, aspects of human health. I will not go to the details of what we do to check uh, safety. We operate within the, um, the Codex Alimentarius and also within the OECD protocols and uh, um, second schedule of the Katayana protocol. But basically this is what uh, the route that uh, uh, GEM product goes through before it gets to the commercial arena. It starts within the lab proof of concepts, and uh, that is where uh, a lot of uh, participants here are operating, academia and the research. Then a greenhouse or greenhouse uh, uh, part, then it goes to confined field trials. And all these are called contained use. These are con uh, regulated by the contained use regulation. Then we have the level of environmental release where some of the things that take place uh, that are uh, covered by other agencies are uh, uh, national performance trials by KEFIS and also NEMA will undertake an environmental impact assessment around this space. Then uh, finally, when, uh, when all these requirements are fulfilled, the particular GEM uh, uh, product is, uh, is commercialized. Uh, this is a scheme basically to illustrate the processes of, uh, that we undertake uh, in, uh, in regulating the conduct of business in GMOs. We receive an application, check for completeness, the very basic uh, checks. <clears throat> we put a notice in public newspapers, uh, inviting public comments, and then uh, we uh, subject it to a panel of socioeconomic experts then we subject it to an analysis by the relevant regulatory agencies. If it's a crop, for example, it will go to KEFIS. And then we also subject it to a set of expert reviewers who come from our um, technical sectors, including academia. Now, uh, all this information is processed within our secretariat and a consolidated risk assessment uh, from all these inputs is presented to the board, including the submission by the public and the socioeconomic consideration. And the board of the authority makes a decision either to approve or to reject the particular project within 90 and 150 days. Uh, these are some of the um, uh, projects that we have approved over time. Uh, again, uh, this data may not be fully updated, but generally it gives you a feel of uh, the kind of proposals that we have dealt with or applications. Uh, in contained and a contained use, we have handled 35 applications. None has been rejected or withdrawn. We have about two pending. I'm sure these have been cleared, but again, uh, we need to, I'll need to update this slide. But generally in that space, we have had uh, about 37. And a contained uh, use or confined field trials we have had 14 applications. All of these have been approved. And uh, under import, export, and transit, we made about, um, we got about 28 applications. Two have been withdrawn. And um, uh, the, the, the total that we have handled is 30, and we have approved 28. Uh, environmental release or placing on the market, we have received uh, three. One was re uh, rejected and the total is four. I will say something little about the rejected project. This was project on uh, gypsophila flower. It was purely rejected, not on aspects of safety, but on aspect of socioeconomics. It was argued by the socioeconomists that uh, approving such a flower may have a negative impact on our imports to the European Union, which is uh, considered um, uh, reasonably restrictive in the in the uh, the way they, they handle uh, genetically modified organisms, and that was the basis upon which 
this particular proposal was uh, was project was rejected. They they made an appeal. The appeal was also didn't go through. And uh, future discussions are open uh, for possibilities. But that is where we are with that particular project. Those that have been um, uh, released for an environmental release include uh, BT cotton, which is already in pharma fields. I don't have to go to the details of what happened along the way. We did this when there was still the ban and uh, we were able to convince uh, cabinet that indeed this doesn't pose any safety issues and therefore this was approved for environmental release. We have just released BT maize that is uh, engineered to resist the maize stock borer and this had been cleared by all agencies. It was waiting for the cabinet to, to make approval on a case by case, but once the ban was lifted, we have been able to issue uh, the decision document for this. The next online is uh, virus resistant cassava, cassava that is resistant to uh, brown streak uh, virus. And this has gone through all the phases as well. Uh, even the environmental impact assessment has been conducted. I think it's finalization of the permit from uh, Enema, and this is about to get into the uh, national performance trials. Uh, one of the mechanisms that we have is an appeal mechanism. If an applicant is aggrieved uh, by the decision made by the NBA, the first step is to request NBA to review its decision. And the second, if that doesn't happen to the satisfaction of the applicant, the applicant can uh, take the, the decision to the Biosafety Appeals Board, which is also established by the Biosafety Act. Um, there are emerging issues that have been mentioned by previous speakers. Genome editing is gaining traction now as, a, as even a, a swifter and easier alternative to GMOs. And we have developed guidelines that will guide people that intend to engage in this particular technology, both at uh, laboratory and also at uh, uh, product release stages. Uh, synthetic biology, uh, stacked genes, you know, events that are placed on one another to have, for example, maize that is both uh, uh, insect resistant and also uh, drought tolerant and therefore have two transgenic events on one variety. We have developed guidelines around that. Uh, low level presence and adventitious presence, presence of material that is of GMO in, uh, in consignments for trade that are considered non-GMO, there are levels internationally agreed and we have also developed guidelines ar around that. Uh, application of modern biotechnology in animals, we have developed uh, guidelines on animal biotech and post-commercialization monitoring of GM crops. This is a, a, um, uh, an argument that keep coming. How do we follow up? And we have developed a, a guideline on that. Coordination among relevant agencies, uh, we have a, co a coordination framework. And uh, the other emerging issue is activism including litigation against modern biotechnology. But I am glad that um, even those that are averse to GMOs have uh, confirmed that they aren't against the modern biotechnology or any other technology, but uh, they are concerns of safety. Uh, lifting of the ban, this one has uh, uh, implications, but we are managing this. Uh, in response to this, we have developed a step-by-step -step, uh, document that outlines how uh, uh, importations, export, and even transit of material containing GM commodities will be conducted. So um, these are some of the things that are found us. I want to stop at that point. I will not share this document. Uh, somebody can access it from our website. Basically, it is talking about step-by-step um, -step way of uh, applying for clearance to import uh, material that is genetically modified. Uh, thank you very much, uh, facilitator. Okay, thank you very much, uh, uh, Datari. Thank you very much for that presentation that brings us to the end of our uh, presenters today. You have explained the, the process of getting approval, the process of testing, and uh, it makes it clear the, the country has a robust system of ensuring we are doing things the, the right way. And uh, it's also good you have given us a disclosure on where we are at with regard to the different crops, and that is very much appreciated as well. And so with that, I want to appreciate all our speakers, and now we go into the
question and answer session. I will request, I can see there is great appreciation from many people who have been listening. I will request then as we ask our questions or make our observations, please make recommendations, isolate issues that are, require greater clarity and point out where we can improve and make things better. Before uh, you, there is a, let me just issue some guidance. I know there are some questions that have been put in the chat box. There are many issues that have been highlighted and we we'll try to pick some of them. But if you, if anyone wants to ask a question, you know, verbally, please raise your hand. You can go to the reaction button at the bottom of your screen. If you click there, you will see one that enables you to raise your hand. And as we do that, let me ask the, 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 the first three questions to each one of the, the speakers. The first question, I would like to direct it to Anne, uh, who was our first speaker. There is a question, uh, an issue raised that Kenya has lagged behind in the green revolution. And there is a fear we might lag behind in the gene revolution. From your standpoint, and considering the constituency you, you represent, do you see that we run the risk of lagging behind the gene revolution? That one. For uh, Professor Odor, there is a, a question that was asked, why the quick shift? The EU isn't moving as fast as we are moving. And yet they have as good experts as we have here in Kenya, as your uh, presentation so clearly showed. Please shed light on that. For Dr. Mugira, two questions, one small one. Are there GMO products in Kenya currently? And secondly, what do you think about public participation? Has it been undertaken? Is it adequate? Should we do more? Thank you. I'll ask the questions be answered in the order. Anne Maina first, Professor Udul, and then Dr. Mugera. Thank you. Thank you very much, Prof. And uh, thank you to all the presenters uh, this morning. Um, the question was, uh, is there a risk of Kenya lagging behind because uh, the notion is that we lagged behind with the Green Revolution. I think uh, we've also spoken on the issues of the Green Revolution in Africa. Uh, people say that it, it worked in Asia, but a lot of questions have been raised about it. Uh, the Green Revolution is mostly pushing for the increased use of uh, synthetic fertilizers, uh, GMOs now, and other uh, products in Kenya, uh, with the notion that this will revolutionize our food and uh, increase food security in the country. Uh, I want to give an example of one of the counties that is in Kenya, uh, Transoya, uh, particularly Kitale region, where for a long time, maize, uh, we've always said that it is an area where there's always been a bumper harvest is one of Kenya's food most productive zone. But over the years, with the too much use of synthetic fertilizers, production has gone down. And you know, with the, a lot of these fertilizers, you you continue have to use more as the years go by, so that you can produce uh, increased amount of food or the same value. And one of the issues that we have raised about uh, that intense use of uh, synthetic fertilizers, uh, toxic pesticides, herbicide, and fungicides, is that eventually it kills the soils, it kills the soil microorganisms. And those negative effects, as I said, are not seen in the generation that does that, but in the future generation. What we are promoting uh, as people working in the agroecological space is a promotion of agroecology. And when I talk about agroecology, there are several principles in there, principles of uh, uh, coexistence, principles of uh, ensuring that as you produce uh, food now, you retain the, 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 the quality of the soils, uh, the nutritional quality even of the food that you produce. And uh, agroecology has been seen to be a way that is one of the ways that we can conserve our ecosystem, not at the expense of too much use of these uh, um, synthetic uh, fertilizers or some of those toxic pesticides. And then, so for us, a green revolution in Africa, I don't think is the way to go. To go. Uh, we need uh, to practice agroecology. And that notion that you're going to be left behind is not right because at the end of the day, the GMOs, most of the, the crops that are commercialized, uh, BT cotton, BT maize, canola, and soya, 
uh, a very small uh, portion of the crops that we need in terms of nutritional diversity. We need to put more uh, resources in, for example, building and uh, promoting our sorghum, our millets and all those. If you go to our neighbors just here in Uganda, food is not just, in fact, maize is not a, a really that high in the agenda. It's bananas, is a sweet potato, it's cassava and all those. Uh, the US is now uh, moving towards uh, promotion of sorghum. They have done their research and seen it as and seen it as a very um, important food crop nutritionary. And uh, this is something that uh, we need to prioritize. Sorghum is uh, indigenous to us in the Lake Trukana region, uh, Karamoja, that area is indigenous to Africa. And not uh, when I talk about sorghum, it's not the gadam that we we produce for, for Kenya breweries or our friends who are producing uh, brews, uh, but the diversity of that sorghum. And the National Museums of Kenya has been at the forefront in terms of uh, documenting these varieties, we are at the risk of losing them. And so it should not be an issue of a green revolution or a GMO revolution. For us, we need uh, diversity. Uh, there's so many questions that I raised even when we were speaking. And uh, one question that I keep on asking Professor Odor, who has been my friend since the ban, what have they done as Kenyatta University Biotechnology uh, Department? Have you done local clinical trials local trials to prove that this GMAs it can, can we, what are the effects in Kenya? Because that is one question that I keep on asking. Why should we depend on research that's coming from the West? Thank you, Professor Maina. Hi, thank you very much, Anne. So, uh, Professor Odor. Thank you, Prof. Um, uh, the question was, why, is, uh, why were we so quick? Um, and then there is a comparison with EU. I'll start by saying, uh, um, good people, that um, our situation and the EU situation is different. Um, if you look at the last cartoon that I showed, where we were asking about what is your opinion on the shortage of food in the rest of the world, and you saw the kind of responses that were coming from different places. One of, for the EU, they were asking what is shortage, and it is true. The EU is not missing, it's not lacking food. It's not lacking at all. And our case now um, is to say that when they there will be a challenge, just like what we saw during the corona, they were quick actually to, you know, to enjoy GMO vaccines and there was no any concern. So that is why I keep saying the situations are different. And any person who tries to compare Kenya and EU in terms of food uh, production and food security is also not fair. The kind of, actually, if you ask me, there is no any large scale farmer in Kenya. If we go with the yardsticks of the EU and, 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 and the Europe, there is none because we are talking about several millions of acres. We don't have even a single million of acres of doing one single, uh, you know, uh, single agriculture. And that is why I'm saying it is not quick. Remember, the ban was mounted in 2012. It has taken us 10 good years to get this ban lifted. And in the intervening period, and that's why Anne is saying we've been friends since the ban was mounted, because we've interacted so many times discussing this issue. And therefore, from where I sit, I feel that uh, the comparison is first of all not right, because these two countries are at different food security status. But also to say that that EU that we conveniently keep citing is the leading importer of GM you know, foods, and they label it for animal feed. But I also said it, who eats the animal? Where did that DNA go? If you are able to answer that question, then you will just get to know that this is a global economic war. It's not about the safety as such, but also just to make them comfortable for your information. Spain is also in EU and it is growing and cultivating GM crops. So, so, so this, these are the reality of the ground. So you, you, know, you pick these things depending on your needs. But also having said that, um, um, uh, when a moderator, allow me to also follow on on the question around sorghum. The sorghum that Anne is very happy with is actually uh, indigenous, and that's true. And here in the lab, however indigenous it is, it cannot grow in a drought tolerant environment if compared to when the real drought gets there. And that is why in this very, very lab, we have stacked genes 
that we have pulled from Xerophyta viscosa, which is that grass that grows on the rock, and moving it to the to, to sorghum so that we can get sorghum that is drought tolerant at an advanced level. And Steve actually is very active in this particular sorghum research. Okay. And looking at the what have we done in terms of clinical research, you know, and this is my personal uh, conviction. Why are we talking about clinical research in matters food? Clinical stuff are left for drugs. GMO foods are not drugs. This, and instead we would rather talk about toxicity assays, which is something that we do right from the lab. And I think Dr. Mugira explained the processes they go through. Let me tell you, good people, so that you understand how, how precise the GMO research is regulated. Before you even start touching anything in these very biosafety lab level tools that we work in, that whole concept must be submitted to this National Biosafety Authority so that they look at it critically for them to realize, first of all, what you want to do. Does it have history of safe use? Are you picking it from a source that is known to be allergenistic, uh, you, know, you know, that triggers allergenicity? Is it safe? What are the toxicology? So from the lab, to the confined field trial, to the national performance before it gets out. And even once it has been released, don't be fooled, there is post-release monitoring, which they still do. So we are well covered holistically in terms of this matter. And what, more importantly, the regulatory agencies can stop the research when you do it at any given time. So if you are asking about the clinical research, by the way, there is no any longest clinical research that can be done more than 25 years that the GMO, uh, you know, maize and all soya have been, been eaten in the rest of the world. From 1998, this GMO has been eaten in South Africa, in the US and many parts of, we should be seeing people dropping down the dead as a result of eating GMO. But the other things that we are talking about in terms of the future generation, you know, the future generation is good to think that way and it is good and that's why we are doing all these things. But it's also important to realize that, that every technology must be considered within the ambits of the regulations and they keep moving. And my final submission, sir, is that by the way, the mutation that we are doing, targeted mutations that we do when we are doing genetic mutation is at least controlled. Mutation is a natural occurrence. Whether we want it or not, it will still happen. For the last, we are not the same people compared to our great grandfathers. And that means that there is a natural occurrence of mutation. All we are doing is not new. It is just saying we are targeting it for purposes of something that can increase food production. And genetic engineering is not a silver bullet. I hear this a lot. We are not saying here that genetic engineering, once it is here, we, if the drought comes, it will stop it. No, if it is for drought insect, insect tolerance, it is only the insects that will be protected. A GMO maize will not harvest itself and take itself in the granary and you know grind itself into flour. No, so this food systems and the value chains and the food chains must still be optimized alongside the GMO technology. Thank you. Right, thank you, Professor Odur. Uh, I can see a, a follow-up question in the chat there. An interesting observation, and maybe you'll respond to it later, regarding the necessity for clinical testing, uh, you know, for this, to assure the, the safety of that. And I think partly also directed to Dr. Roy Mugera to comment on the role of public health department in the testing. So Dr. Mugera. Uh, thank you, thank you, thank you very much, uh, uh, facilitator. Uh, I want to start quickly by, of course, indicating that um, uh, this is not a, a rebuff and answer back session, but uh, basically to provide as much information as possible to our participants. Uh, but I would like to mention a few things that were highlighted earlier by previous speakers. One on, uh, on golden rice, uh, that it provides uh, only very little vitamin A. Uh, that could be true, but uh, again, why not have that little that can be afforded than the carrot? But I think that is a discussion elsewhere. Uh, on on Seralini publication, I am a little disturbed uh, facilitator that we still make reference to this particular publication. The jury is out there. A lot of participants here are scholars. They can turn that science up and down and check uh, both sides. But again, not appearing to be a rejoinder, giving a rejoinder 
I want to respond to the very specific questions that were uh, directed on my way. Public participation. Uh, a question came in on uh, a, a politician has indicated the need for public participation. This is a requirement of not only the constitution, but even the Biosafety Act. We are required to conduct public participation on a case by case basis. Like I always tell um, people who are um, uh, asking questions about GMOs, a GMO is not one big thing that is coming from some place and entering our room. It is a very specific um, kind of a project or kind of uh, intervention like the BT maize or BT cotton that is, um, is uh, modified for a very specific purpose. So when we conduct um, uh, assessment for safety, we do it on a case by case basis. And we publish this material in a local, uh, local newspapers and invite uh, public to make uh, their comments and also to either agree with us or disagree and all that data is analyzed. The question that we should ask and uh, which again, we can leave it out there is how adequate is our public participation? How can you say that that is enough public participation? Is it when you ask every Kenyan to say what they think? Is it when you do something like the elections that we just concluded the other day? Is it when you post online? I can say that I have posted the issue on our website. Go to www.bra and give your comment. Is that adequate public participation? Even publishing in the in the Daily Nation, for example, and and the, the Standard and others, is that adequate? So the adequacy is a question that is out there. <clears throat> and one other thing that uh, the, the the question the person who has the question is: Are we doing enough? I can confess that. Um, out of my very basic interactions with the public out there, the, the, we haven't done enough. And we, this is an area that will continuously be of need to create public awareness uh, and public education on what this particular technology is all about. Of course, not trying to create um, additional professor duals out there, but generally to have people have the confidence, like the basic knowledge that will build confidence even in the, in, the, in the assessment of safety that we do. Uh, the question of sex reversal tilapia, um, is it a GM? To the best of my knowledge, this is not a GM approach. It is um, uh, the only fish that we are aware of out there that is of GM is salmon that has been genetically modified for content of uh, oleic acid. Again, uh, I may not be able to exactly say what is this with the sex reversal in tilapia. Probably our, our colleague uh, Odwal or anyone else online may be able to shed some more light on that. Are there GMO products in Kenya? Since the ban, we did not approve any. And um, we, we set out, you see, as a government agency, we implement government policy. When the government said, close the doors. We went to Mombasa and established an office at the port. We went to the JKIA, established an office there. We went to Namanga, we went to Busia, the farthest that we could go at that time. And we've been there ever since. We haven't seen any coming in and we have been conducting surveillance. We haven't seen any uh, within the space of the 10 years. There is a time when um, a product called Aromat was found in the shelves and I think that matter was handled and concluded. I do not want to go back into that. Uh, somebody asked how to distinguish GMOs and non-GMOs. And I also saw a question asking whether the public or the farmers have been educated how to handle GMOs. A GM maize is exactly the same as the other one. The only difference is, for example, if it is BT maize, when the pest come in, the one that is non-GM will be destroyed or damaged. The one that is GM will, will not be damaged. That is the only difference you can see. Otherwise, as a farmer, you will require to plant your seeds the same way. You will require to weed your crop. You will require to apply fertilizer if the soil requires so. So there is no special handling of uh, GM. It is basically maize like any other, only that it has that trait that enables it to do something extra. And therefore, you cannot look at anything. I have also seen um, comments online that... Uh, 
uh, when you see a tomato that is big and smooth and nice and looking clean, that is GMO. That is not true. You will not be able to distinguish GMO by just looking at GM crop, but looking at the, at the, the expressed traits. What is the role of BPH? Plays a central role in the decision-making process because we rely on results of uh, long-term feeding studies that are accompanied with dossiers that are submitted to us uh, for analysis in the decision-making process. The Directorate of Public Health is also represented in our board, even after our board was reduced to the nine to, co uh, to conform with Mwongozo, uh, DPH is one that has remained a member of our board and therefore they participate in every decision making at all levels. They are also members of our technical committee. I thank you, facilitate. I hope I have been able to touch all that. I wish we had less time in the presentations and more time in this interactive phase, but uh, nevertheless, uh, we've done well. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Mugera. We, we still have, uh, in the interest of the people who have raised their hearts, I will just ask you, hang on a bit, allow us to extend by a couple of minutes. And I'll ask our presenters also, Dr. Mugera, please, and, and uh, Professor Udu, please stay on. Uh, I would like to give this uh, time to, because we have some people who's had up in this order, please very quickly, uh, very briefly, you ask your question or make your statement. Uh, Luce Kamau, uh, you start, you have the mic, you can turn your mic on. Thank you, uh, Professor Maina, the coordinator of this meeting. I'll make some observations that may be responded to by uh, Professor Oduol. And my first comment is about the corona vaccine that he has referred to a number of times. And I would like to say that it is in the public domain that there were quite a number of side effects that were reported in many countries of the world as a result of the coronavirus. I think to the best of my literature check, it's one of the pioneer messenger RNA viruses that has been used for humans. And I would also ask him to tell us why it has taken so long for us to have, uh, let's say, such a, such a, a genetic, let's say the DNA viruses, this is messenger RNA, which we know that it even has a very short half-life. So there's still a lot of controversy about messenger RNA viruses and also the DNA viruses. And particularly messenger RNA viruses, they are, I, I mean the messenger RNA vaccines, because any foreign messenger RNA is destroyed by because of the RNA interference uh, strategy of the organisms. So I think uh, he would need to shed more light. And I would say that it is not the best of a success story about the, the DNA vaccines are called that, even though we know that it's messenger RNA. And my other concern about the GMO uh, organisms, of course, we have seen places like the US, there is a time they were working on a genetically modified mosquito. And you can ask yourself, mosquito is not one of the very important vectors in the US, particularly for human diseases. And they have a lot of other important diseases, including Trypanosoma cruzii, which is uh, transmitted by bugs. And why have they not given priority to generating genetically modified bugs that transmit their own diseases, which are of very high public health importance in their country? And why prioritize the mosquito, which is literally an African vector? So I would want to say that even the discussions that I have participated in about these genetically modified vectors, literally people agree that that is not the way to go. The way to go is to control the vectors using other means. 
So I'd like him to respond to us about that. The other case that I would like to point out is that particularly in Horat, they have a very successful tourism industry, which is done by genetically modified flowers. And since the time they have been using these uh, the flower parts, they don't allow the flowers to cross pollinate with the wild flowers. The flowers are grown and crossed in the parks, and then they are destroyed immediately after the season. So if these GMOs are all that very attractive, why have the developed countries not allowed them to cross pollinate with, the, with their wild, let's say their wild organisms? And then I would also like to observe I, I think it, uh, Dr. Uh, it is, <laughs> Dr. Yes, yeah, let, just let's just leave it there for now. Yeah. It's just, just, brief, one more. just brief, brief. Yeah, brief. Okay, very brief, Ray. I'd like to say that our saying that we want to partake of the GMO, that global biotechnology party, whatever we want, I think it would challenge us to develop our own genetically modified seeds and not literally to import. Because when we generate our own, then we know what, uh, what issues to address. Anyway, there are quite a lot of observations. If you look at the chicks which are imported by Ken chick, they literally have to be reared in sterile conditions. And when farmers have to get those chicks, they have to, we don't breed them here. It's only Ken chick that has the conditions to breed them. So I think there is a lot of risk in these GMOs and we need to do our homework properly before we can embrace this technology and get overexcited about it. Thank you, uh, coordinator. Okay, thank you very much, uh, uh, Dr. Ari. Uh, and uh, your questions have been noted and they'll be responded to. I would like to ask the next question, question uh, presenter will be, that's a uh, professor who, that's uh, James Kongo. If you are there, please, you can ask your question. Thank you, Professor Mwangi. Thank you for uh, our presenters who have done a very good job starting with Anne, Professor Duol, and even Dr. Mugira. Uh, maybe what I, from hearing from the three presenters, one thing we have to agree all of us is that as a Kenyan, we need research. But sometimes whatever we are doing, it is not having, we are not putting our priority right. And this is something that I used to talk with the read Professor Machuka. Like now in Kenya, when we talk about that uh, we are now approving the, or we have approved the BT maze, is that really our main problem in this nation? You realize that what is the main cause of low crop yield, low maize yield in Kenya? And uh, Professor Mwangi, as an agriculturist, you agree with me that uh, the poor fertilizer, the low amount of fertilizer application and drought, those are the main causes of why farmers are getting very low yield. And a good example is a country like Malawi. We know what happened with their president, the late Mudarika, when he came to power. How did he solve the problem of food insecurity in Malawi? He subsidized fertilizer prices. And within one year, Malawi was able to export maize even to Kenya. Today, we know, look at the East African country, uh, uh, many Sub-Saharan African countries. Look at the amount of fertilizer that we apply, about 13 kilogram per hectare compared to what is America and other countries apply, more than 90 kilograms per, per hectare. And therefore, I'm saying that sometimes we are giving priority in our research to where it does not really give us a very high return. Research is good, but we should also concentrate on where are we going to get the highest return. For, uh, for Anne, let me tell her that uh, I heard her saying that Fertilizer is a uh, or synthetic fertilizer is destroying uh, the destroying the soil and therefore because of that we should not 
be a prime synthetic fertilizer. In fact, I can tell you, yes, when you, are, you keep on applying like what is happening in our North Reef, where they are always applying DAP, they make the soil to be uh, acidic. And if the soil is this, acidic, very easy, apply lime, and then you, uh, you, are, you are going to be able to get the right pH for the soil. And that way, you're going to increase the yield of your maize, but we can never do without uh, uh, inorganic fertilizers. Even if you try to look for some of the nutrients, you can get organic uh, uh, phosphorus. Uh, you can ne never get organic uh, phosphorus. It has to be inorganic. And maybe to uh, somebody like uh, Professor, uh, like Dr. Mogira, one thing I wanted to hear from him. Currently in Kenya, do we have any product that has undergone through the whole cycle where we are now can now say it is at the commercialization stage or it has been commercialized. And if we have that product, which is that product? And how do we as consumers know? Because when I go to the shop, I need to know whether I'm buying a GMO product or non-GMO product. We know what is happening in the uh, US. US, you fight their Food and Drug Administration regulate all food from genetically engineered plants. And this food, they must meet the same safety requirement as non-GMO food. Do we have those kind of uh, regulation and requirements in our own country? Thank you very much. But the discussion was quite an interesting one. OK, thank you very much, uh, Professor Kunu. So we'll take one more uh, question from one more person, and then we, we allow that. We, we have a bit of extension, so I'll ask all our presenters uh, and our participants, if you have time, please stay. We'll be able to take a couple of questions before we close. So the next question, I will invite uh, Salim Juma, if you are online. Okay, I think Salim may not be there. Elizabeth Kimani. Okay. Elizabeth is also not there. Then we can take from uh, Solomon Burunga. Solomon, you can ask, you can take the mic. But your mic is off, Solomon, if you are speaking. Okay, I still cannot hear Solomon. Right. Miriam, Hello, Miriam, can you, can you now? Sorry. Uh, okay. Okay, Solomon, you can speak. Oh, thank you, Prof. Um I, I want to be a bit uh brief with my question and uh, my comments about uh, GM. Um, normally we say that whoever pays the piper calls the tune. And I can tell you uh, most of these, uh, most of our scholars in GM have been sponsored by Bill Gates Foundation. And the Bill Gates Foundation, uh, Bill he has an interest in GM because he's the biggest shareholder of Monsanto, which was bought by Bayern. And what do they do? They make GM purposely in order to sell their herbicides and pesticides and other, you know, other components that is used to grow the GM. So we owe this, uh, this country some very serious, because these are the cream de la cream. Professor Odor is top scientist. We also need to be vigilant for our society, for our people. We've had Bill Gates even before COVID-19 saying there will be a flu. He predicted. So we are not sure really what is happening. So number one, most of, most of our scholars are being sponsored, especially in biotechnology by Bill Gates Foundation. That is an open secret. And um, that's why we should be worried sometimes why we are advancing. As the previous uh, speaker just asked question, why are we focusing on GM and not providing, you know, fertilizers in order to increase food production? Why are you focusing on GM? GM is purposely used in order to sell herbicide by buyer because those are the, 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 how they make their money. It's nothing to do with the food production because 
research has, has shown that GM does not increase food production. It actually doesn't. I don't know which country it has. It's just some little, little um, flowering words, but in essence, is the sole purpose, especially for this big biotech, is to sell their seeds, and then they sell their herbicide to us. So what are the consequences of this? In my opinion, I don't have any reference. Number one, we are going to lose our seeds, our local seeds. They will give us very good seeds now, like Monsanto. Even Monsanto, I think um, I'll come back to it. They will give us very good seeds. Uh, and then later, you know, put the self-terminating gene, and then we'll be depending on them for seeds. Now, we even changed our laws to talk about certified seeds so that our, our seeds, we cannot be able to sell our local seeds, our grandmothers used. We have to buy certified seeds from, you know, organization. And which are these certified seeds? These are mostly um, these GM and so on that have been processed through these legal bodies that are sponsored by Monsanto's and so on and so forth. So we owe this country a serious, um, you know, we must be responsible as scientists because even other countries, they are struggling. Over, over this, uh, recently we are struggling with non-communicable diseases. We don't know where they are coming from. Nearly every homestead is struggling. It has something to do with food. As we speak, uh, cancer for esophagus, stomach, liver, and so on, they're almost all coming is the third one, near breast cancer uh, and cervical. So that is something that we need to really to, to put some thought into it. Then um, this biotech, they even influence policies in different countries because of their financial masks. The way they influence our scholars, the way they removed Seralini's paper through global politics, it is the same way they are going to manipulate policies here. I'm saying this because it might sound not scientific, but it is something that you need to put in a lot of thought as Kenyans, as patriots, because we might be putting ourselves into serious trouble with this kind of research. This Seralini that people are criticizing was given, was given a whistleblower of the century. Because yeah, it's I, I think so, Solomon, <laughs> Solomon is okay. The, the, the point was made. Okay. I, I, I think, let, me, yeah. let me talk about yeah. one thing, one more last thing. Eh? This GM has a potential to become, to be used as a biological weapon. It can, you can insert a, some genes the way Prof is saying, and it can be used to wipe out a particular community. Are we safe in our country? We don't mind our own GM. Mm -hmm. uh, that is, that's not a problem, which we can be able to produce at a large scale for our farmers. But when okay. we are being controlled by foreigners to come up with this, uh, this GM things from, from their biotech companies, we are in serious trouble. Last but not least, because the regulatory body is here, why is Monsanto seed still in the market? Monsanto is purposely, they do GM. But when you go to the local on the ground, they are selling these seeds to our farmers. GM from Monsanto. So I want clarification whether they are sure that this is, these are not GM. Yet they are from Monsanto and Bayer. Yet these are uh, GM companies that they make seeds that are genetically modified and they are sold at the local level. So thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Solomon. Uh, some pertinent issues raised there and, and quite a couple of issues there. I think this need uh, clarity. I'll, I'll just ask the others who have questions to, to hold it now and I'll invite our panel of speakers to respond to these issues, but also so that we can cover the questions remaining, uh, I would like to ask the, the, our speakers as you respond. Please take about two minutes at most, two minutes to respond to the couple of issues and then we leave it there. Thank you. We can start with Anne Maina. Uh, thank you very much, uh, uh, Professor Maina. I think uh, there's the issue of Terminator that keeps on being mentioned. I think it has been clarified. Uh, Terminator technology was never uh, commercialized. So it's not a, an issue here because it had been done research on, but was never commercialized. Uh, then uh, um, the issue of the flowers and uh, GMO flowers uh, in Holland, which was mentioned by Dr. Kamau, and the issue that the fact that the flowers are never left to reach a point where there's cross-pollination. Uh, recently, uh, maybe just this year, the National Environmental Management Authority called for comments uh, on a EIA that was done on the GMO cassava. And uh, we raised several queries about that uh, because even when we visited the NEMA offices, 
and uh, questioned uh, the fact that even uh, the consultants who are working on that EIA had not followed the terms of reference. And uh, this is a cause for worry when such a document uh, moves past uh, a point where we are going for public participation. We wrote our written comments, but when we also visited uh, NEMA and raised those concerns. And so it's important that even our uh, regulatory agencies remain quite alert and aware. Uh, I think uh, we have talked of issues of who is controlling the research. The application for BT uh, cotton, BT maize is done in collaboration with local uh, um, our research agencies like CALRO, but uh, the funders or, or the other people who are associated with it are mostly the multinationals that are interested in uh, in the in the in the profits. Uh, of course, the need to do local research and uh, Professor Dur, this is a challenge. Uh, now you're the head of research, uh, please prioritize that. Uh, also, you see philanthropy giving with one hand, but of course with interest in the other end. Uh, it, it should not pass us that uh, very a very big, big philanthropist was in Kenya and now we're here, we're bringing in 10 million bags of GMO maize. And so these are quite serious issues that uh, we need to talk about. And thank you, KU, let's have more of these uh, webinars. Let me keep it up to there because others need to react. Thank you. All right, thank you very much, Anne. Professor Udur. Well, it appears, uh, Chair, that almost the questions were targeting this side. And I'm very happy that uh, Dr. Lucy Kamau has uh, highlighted uh, quite a number of things, but I think some of the questions will require longer explanation than now. Regarding side effects of, of the corona vaccine, uh, the, the, the whole understanding is that in drug discovery, all the drugs, if you buy them, you will get a paper in there that outlines the side effects. Side effects um, is, is, is not a new thing in, in, in any drug and doctors who are here will tell you that uh, it so long as it is at an acceptable situation and it's not really uh, doing any physiological major thing that is lethal, then um, you still allow it to go. By the way, there are even drugs, particularly for the sleeping sickness, the, the you know, trypanosomiasis and the rest that you're talking about, the drug that is in the market actually kills 20% of the people who take it and it's still commercialized. So the discussion around the drugs is deeper than what you have highlighted. And I'm sending you this having participated in the drug discovery in one of the largest pharmaceutical companies in the world called Pfizer. And I, I know it from which clinical to the clinical you know, um, bit of it. There is a lot more discussion that we can't exhaust here. Um, Dr. But just to unpack and for you to understand why are you talking about the messenger RNAs and how they are destroyed, well, the, the, the only uniqueness in these particular ones and the reason why it's becoming more trendy is because at the end of it or once you've done your MRA, they are very easily perishable. If you allow me to use that word, they degrade very easily. But in drug discovery, they are covered in the, you know, what we call the lipid nanoparticles. That is what covers it until it gets a particular place where when the lipid nanoparticles now opens up and then it deals with it. But the whole idea about this is because of the fear, the conventional and immunologists, the Professor Ragos, the you know, Susan Muzelis who are in here will tell you that the whole idea of this vaccine is because before they were putting subunit or attenuated and all that kind of stuff, which would have had this disadvantage of reverting. Now, the, the, the cleverness and the, unique, the uniqueness of RNA vaccine is that you actually get the RNA, uh, which actually translates into a particular epitope, the section of the whole uh, membrane that is responsible for triggering antibody development. So you are not actually getting the entire organism in there, but just uh, proteins generated from this. And it is, it, it's a thing that has developed since 1700 when the first uh, successful you know, um, vaccines were developed by Edward Gina. Up to now, this has been actually a growth that has been ongoing. Regarding mosquitoes and uh, sterility of them, I can just invite you to Camry. There's a good research happening there around this. And the whole idea, and sometimes it is very interesting, Doctor, when you talk about why is the US working on mosquitoes and yet they have their own diseases. You know, when you subject, you know, project such a statement, then I begin to start getting a feeling whether have we reached one level where every country for its own and you can't do anything that is good for Uganda or for Tanzania, just because we have our own drought 
we shouldn't figure out anything that is good like banana for Ugandans? Is that where we are now as, as, a, as, a, as a globe? You know, because querying the reason why the US is doing research in mosquito and, uh, and not other diseases is from where I sit, I feel that it wasn't well laced up, at least to, for this level. But the, the idea here is to deal with the vectors and the vectors, the discussion around the mosquitoes and whether that's the right strategy or not, is a completely different thing. Biodiversity comes in, the food web, food chain comes in, entom entomologists will come in and tell you what is happening with these insects. So it's a, it's, it's a decent discussion. It's just one of the things that should be done. And by the way, when you see outputs and prototypes out there, there are a lot of research that have gone through the lab before it reaches there. So don't inhibit researchers ahead of the real innovation. Once the innovation is out, then you test it in the market and the market itself, by the way, including this GMO debate, I keep telling people, we are actually probably wasting time. Let the GMO be here. Let the country say we are not eating it. It will just die a natural death because we could be holding our breath here thinking it's GMO, GMO, and yet people have moved. We have now gone to genome editing. We are no longer this transgenic thing that we are discussing here. It's stale, by the way, it's old. And you can see that NBA has already moved to genome editing and making legal frameworks to protect us against that thing. So this, uh, the, the, the mosquito dis discussion is very interesting, but I have uh, more explanations around this mosquito thing that we can discuss, and luckily we, we are reachable. Um, cross-pollination in terms of the flowers and everything else. You know, I when we start saying, I want to keep my maize seeds, I don't want GMO. Sometimes ask yourself the question, what, what exactly is in this GMO that is scaring you? When you start that way, then you will get to know, by the way, I could be holding my seed, yet I need the insect protections that is already existing in a GMO plant. The example that um, Anne gave, and thanks for bringing it up, Anne, was around the, the, that controversy that was there in the initial stages of, of, of GMO development, where they, there was pollination in the near neighbor, and then they went to mitigation and everything else. You know, those were the original controversies that marred this technology. People moved. Actually, if you look at it, for instance, if I have my seeds that are, I'm planting as, as a small scale farmer and you have your GM seed that is same, same as mine, only that you have added uh, you know, a, a cryoprotein, which is this BT that we are talking about so that it's protected against the insects. So clearly, if there is pollination that comes to your point, you know, to yours, you are luckier because you are getting, you, you still you have your indigenous, but you are having or actually your maize being uh, you know, um, insect protected. So we need to have a different discussion if the situation in Kenya was that if your pollen moves to my, to my maize, then I'm, I'll be taken to court. And if that is the situation, that's a completely different discussion. And I think uh, it's, it's not acceptable. But my immediate thinking, Chair, if you may allow me, is for people to understand that what is in this GM that is scaring me? I hear people talking about uh, you know, GM seeds and also herbicides. Do you know what are herbicides? Herbicides are the chemicals that you spray to kill the weeds. So if I have bought a GM seed, which is protecting my maize against, say, pests, and it is in a quarter acre, why do I go and buy pesticide to do what? We weed. Literally, we weed. So you don't need the pesticide or the herbicides. What, what, what do you need the, the roundup thing, the herbicide for? You know, and, and those are the reality of this. So when you talk about getting a seed, I would rather get my seed that is insect protected, you know, and then I just weed normally like we do in our villages, we are small scale farmers. And the issue about herbicides is no longer there. The reason why the herbicides became a market for the West was because you have a million acres of maize. How do you line up people to go and weed a million acres? That is why you need maize that has tolerance to that herbicide so that you just plant your maize, it grows, but you bring herbicides and spray it all in your million, whatever. It kills all the weed, but leaves your maize. That is where the herbicide came from. So how do you weed, you know, a, a spray an, an eighth of an acre? You know, so, so this discussion, let's be a little, you know, open with them as we discuss them. Then uh, my, my senior uh, prof, Kumu, and when he talks, uh, I have a lot of humility, uh, prof, and therefore, because of academic seniority, I may not attack this directly, only to advance that, yes, I agree with your sentiments around, uh, around targeting um, constraints and, and challenges that are unique to us, and, and, and that is a very good advice, and that is why when we look at maize 
studies that we are doing at Kenyatta University, we are targeting drought stress. We are targeting cyanide for cassava because that's what we are eating here. We are tar targeting sorghum for you know, drought tolerance because that is for us. And, and we are not going nutritional yet because we still feel these are very, very critical for us. And to that extent, we agree. But whether the fertilizer should be the only focus or more maybe before we go into the GMO, I keep saying that there is no ban as things are right now about optimizing the you know, fertilizers and even the value system and value chain for the farming. That is still there. I only have a problem when the people who are saying, let's go fertilizer and let's uh, do optimize the market, whatever. And I'm asking, who banned those things that you are enumerating? We are only here just because the GMO was banned. Otherwise, if you never banned it, we will still just be supporting you to get the fertilizers done because even GM seeds must be transported to the market. So, but it is a little convenient when you find a discussion where we are saying, focus on irrigation, focus on fertilizer, and don't bring GMO. Yet, somebody would say, focus in fertilizer, focus on irrigation, when you bring the seed that is insect protected, then that combination works. And we are not here saying that bring GMO, replace fertilizer, or don't optimize trust, you know, the, the value chains and everything. That is the platform from where we are. So we are not saying this is a silver bullet. We are saying it's complementary to already existing platform. Now I come to Solomon. Solomon has said everything. Um, um, and and I, I like the fact that he's, he's scared. And genuinely, people do. People get scared. That's the reason why when there was a ban, when there was a paper by Seralini saying there is cancer and we see it and the publication is out, actually, Kenya did the right thing that any other government would do. The government have a responsibility, has a responsibility to actually ensure that the people are protected. And if there is a paper out there that says there is cancer, they stopped it. And we said, okay, then 10 lead, the only challenge that we have is that not only Kenya banned when that paper pulled out, by the way, even Russia and other countries did the banning. But when they go, went through the process and the paper was genuinely looked at globally, and even the French government itself, where Zeralini comes from, actually also denounced it. Once the paper was pulled out, then all the other countries that had actually banned, lift, you know, put in the ban as a result of Zeralini paper, actually lifted the ban. It actually, we need to thank this government that even when the paper was actually retracted, 2013, it still took this government nine years to lift this ban when these discussions are going on. So we have a good government. So let's not you know, hit it so hard as if the government was not so keen. It was very, very keen. Issues around Terminator Gene, thank you, Anne, again, for at least shaping the discussions around GMO. Please, if you are anti this technology and you happen to comment on Terminator Gene, we automatically know that you have no clue what you are saying because it doesn't exist. So I think we need to also you know, in, revisit history so that we are able to have a discussion that speaks to the real issues. Because personally, as things are right now, I have my own concern would be if we have the seeds that we are importing, fine, but are we using the local structures that we have as our Kenya seeds and everything to bulk these seeds? You see, I am a researcher and I believe in this technology, but in terms of now bulking the seeds and utility of or whatever existing locally, I still can comment on it. That is the kind of discussion that we are trying to have around GMO so that we have a better debate. Biological weapons, clearly, let me tell you, what, um, uh, Solomon, when, it's, when you want to kill using biological weapons, you don't need 15 years like the one that the GMO takes in the lab. It's the easiest thing. And so, for instance, when we are taking the BT that we are picking, that we are making the transgenic BT from a Bacillus thuringiensis, which already exists in the soil, it is not new that it's coming to change because it has been moved to another genome. It's the same thing. So biological debate, you know, weapon and all these things is a serious debate that I agree with you that should be looked into. But we cannot mix it in a food debate because that is that is now a security debate. We can't mix those two here. Owning technology, you see, I, I, I sometimes smile from this side when I hear somebody say, we need to have a GMO of our own uh, so that we are comfortable. At that particular point, when you say you want your GMO that is made locally, you have agreed to everything safe, you know, safe about GMO, only that you don't want it coming from Uganda because you want Kenyans to benefit. So when you mix these things, we, we, we are confused as scientists, what exactly do you want? Do you, you are happy with a GMO that is made by Oduor from Kenyatta University? Yes. So it is the Oduor making that makes you happy and not the con real concerns that people are talking about this. And therefore, when it becomes about owning the technology and you hear them who pays the piper, whatever, and if, you know, these are grants. 
when you are given a grant, say by Gates Foundation, and I want to say here, yeah, I have not received any funding from Gates Foundation anyway, and the fundings that we are getting here from NRF, this government, and probably the people who are against this technology, including the biosafety and everything, will also will also want to find out when was the last time they received funding from Kenya government to go against this, because this debate where it has reached is about the international communities are very happy with us debating. You ask yourself a question, and I want you to be very honest, you good people. Why do you think the U.S. with the technology they have and with the safety, if there is an American here and there is a bomb, they will be lifted quickly and we will be left here dying. And you think that that is the very country that is feeding their people with toxic stuff and you want us to buy that. For the, from, from 1998 to now, they are eating. And when we are seeking for visas to go to the U.S., we never think that they, they are 100% soya, you know, GMO. We want visas and when we are denied, we cry because you want to go to a place where they are eating GMO. So at what point did we become hypocritical? And the debate here, we must be open as a country. The debate here is, and the West is very happy with this debate as we are talking, because they are continuing to enjoy as they import to you. They are very happy. So we must get as a country and decide very quickly, is this a debate that we are keeping? Because Africans, our major problem is we over-debate technologies. We over-debated green evolution, we never benefited. When Africa was becoming very critical, okay, let's use fertilizers, let's use tractors. They came up with something okay. called carbon credit. Now oh. we cannot, anytime you export, they're asking you what is the carbon footprint. Now, again, since 1998, we have been having GMO. We are still discussing this. They have moved to genome editing. My friends, we will keep yeah. chasing technology. And okay. my position is, let's accept technology for what it is. Let's debate it objectively and accept where, you know, criticism where necessary, but also look at the bigger picture of this technology. Thank you so much. Chair. Okay, okay, thank you. Thank you, Professor Udul. You've taken quite a bit of time, quite quite a chunk actually, a bit more. And I will ask uh, Dr. Mugera, if you are there, you can take two minutes, hopefully. Thank you, thank you very much. I'll go straight and solid codex. I have to really have a hard stop in the next five minutes. Uh, I want to, uh, to, I'll be required somewhere else. Uh, one, Currently, are there any products? The answer is no. Uh, there are no products in the market. However, we have cotton, BT cotton that is growing in the farms. That is in its, its third cycle now, I guess, in some uh, uh, rainy systems. And um, what product has gone through the full cycle? A classic example is BT cotton. Our friend and colleague, Dr. Charles Waturu of Caro, retired while doing a CFT, confined few trials of BT cotton in Moy and some other locations in this country. So this has gone the whole hog uh, to the point of approval. In fact, an approval that came through at a time of the ban. So it is uh, a product that has gone all the phases, scrutinized even within the confines of the ban and has been approved for cultivation. The second online that will be multiplied in the coming rainy season is uh, BT maize. Again, maize that is modified to resist the maize stock borer. So these two have gone the entire uh, fe uh, route up to the point of approval for commercial uh, cultivation. Uh, how do we know if we find it in the market? There is a labeling regulation. You will recall that my presentation had four sets of regulations, one of which is a labeling regulations and that as, uh, as its provisions, how that uh, will, be, will be done. Um, I want to touch a little on the, as a biological weapon, Kenya is a state party to the Biological Weapons Convention. I had the privilege of serving at the National Commission for Science, Technology and Innovation, NACOSTI, and uh, NACOSTI is the national focal point for the Biological Weapons Convention, a convention that outlaws any stockpiling of biological agents for purposes of use in um, hostile activities. While at that also, I want to emphasize um, this aspect of whoever, whoever pays the piper calls the tune, it is true. But uh, at Nakosti, then when I served there and even now, we developed what is called the national research priorities that informed the disbursement of funds from the National Research Fund. So unless we can really fund our own research and prioritize our own things, we will still be dependent, and I think that is some a discussion elsewhere. But uh, that is uh, the reality of the uh, of the moment. Now, uh, regarding the connection between Bill Gates and uh, GMOs, I do not want to comment on that. Uh, but um, 
well, technology people and business people have the freedom to uh, perpetuate their ideas. Uh, but then again, like as I emphasized in, uh, in my presentation, when we conduct safety assessment, we do uh, food feed safety. We also do environmental safety. I've also seen a question online asking whether the GM crops will not become super weeds. We check that among other things that we check and uh, environmental safety. And also we check socioeconomics. And I want to emphasize that because I think the discussion around Bayer and Monsanto and Bill Gates around uh, the aspect of, uh, of socioeconomics. Uh, the first, uh, last question is why is Monsanto on the ground? Are these seeds selling, are they GM? They are non-GM uh, seeds. And that is that goes back to ask the same question that we have asked. Um, will the GM seeds overtake our own seed system? But Monsanto is already here. Bayer is already here. And, uh, and they are doing business in conventional seed. So uh, if we were to close out, then we would close everybody out. But again, this is not my space. I am just making a comment. As a, as, a, as a scholar in the, in the field, or rather as, as somebody in this field, but my space is on food feed safety and environmental safety, including socioeconomics. So that, that is my thought as, as an institution. Finally, colleagues, of course, it will not be enough if we go away without making a comment on media reports. I rarely uh, comment on media reports attributed especially uh, to my seniors. But I have seen um, the messages going around on a statement or a number of statements that have been made by the Honorable Moses Kuria, the CS for trade. I think uh, on, the, on the larger, the, the context within which that has been taken is not uh, probably accurate. I think the CS was making a genuine light moment kind of comment uh, that was uh, flipped the other way and, uh, and has gone, gone viral. But again, it is not for me to gauge that. And finally, we must also uh, emphasize science as a basis upon which we conduct our regulatory approach. Uh, politics can change, politics do change. I have seen um, uh, polit uh, politicians, of course, uh, who have had one stand yesterday and a different stand today. So uh, let us use a predictable science-based above board and uh, um, uh, approach in the regulation of genetically modified organisms. And that is our commitment as an institution and even as a government. Thank you, facilitator. Thank you very much, Dr. Mugere. We understand you have to leave and thank you for giving us the extra time and for all the insights provided. Thank you so much. We look forward to continue the interaction as we shed light on this important topic. So before Asana, we stop, Asana. thank you, thank you, Dr. Ari. Before we, we come to the end, and I will now be asking our moderator, Mary Mwangi, to be ready to present a summary. There are four persons remaining with their hands up. I would like to give each half a minute, and please don't go beyond half a minute. You will pardon me if I uh, interject. And I'll start with Miriam Kenya. Yeah, thank you, Prof. Uh, I'm a, a scientist. Um applying applying biotechnology in my research and uh, maybe for 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 making it for clarity i was the first chair of the national biosafety authority so as i make this comment i wouldn't want to be misunderstood i want to to carry on with what uh, professor Odur talked about objectivity and what um, Dr. Mugira has ended up by is talking about predictable science. And my comment is this, uh, 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 members, that we need to use science and to argue our case uh, objectively and not be um, taking a handstand as pro or against. I want to use the two examples that uh, Dr. I mean Professor Odor used about the, the the disc and the dance. And uh, Prof, I want to say that uh, if it was someone who was listening, the um, outcome or the treat that would come out if it was a rumba, I mean if, if the disc was singing the same music, 
But if it is a Roomba uh, trait that we wanted to see, we would be able to see it. If it was the blues that we used to dance those times when we were young, we would still see, I mean, we would still dance blues using the same disc. So what am I saying is that traits can come out which were not intended by the, by the researcher. And therefore we should be able to test our, our product to be able to look at it objectively instead of putting a hand stance and saying that this is uh, GM is good to eat and therefore it should be eaten, or GM is not good and we close our mind. That is that is my my comment. And we we as scientists should remember uh, biochemical pathways, and we should remember that uh, codons can code a different amino acid depending on uh, what what is there. And lastly, uh, Prof. Uh, Prof. Ondur, I want to say that uh, mutation breeding, mutation techniques in crop improvement, is a global uh, is globally agreed on that it is not biotechnology. I mean, it is not genetic engineering, and therefore let us not uh, confuse the listeners uh, because mutation techniques is is a technique that is globally accepted. Conventional breeding can also bring out uh, non-wanted results. We have seen it. I've been a conventional breeder for a long while, applying biotechnology, and we have found non-wanted results from very favorable um, parents when we cross them. So let us just, my final shot is that let us take science and argue scientific issues scientifically and objectively, and we will be fine. We will be able to help this country so that we don't look like we do not know science. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. for those insights and uh, really objectivity and predictable science. And thank you for your comments. Uh, you laid the foundations at the NBA and that's very good. Maurice, Dole, your moment briefly. Yeah, thank you very much. My name is Maurice Ndole, and uh, I'm based over in California, and I'm the publisher of Hot Seat News, uh, which is a diaspora-based publication. And uh, the question is to the scientist, uh, Dr. O uh, Professor Odor, uh, by the way, very humorous presentation. You had me laughing over here the whole time. So my question is this, how has scientists, how have scientists allowed for this information to take over science and what can we do moving forward so that the public can understand the benefits and the challenges that you guys are facing in the biotechnology field. And as a molecular biologist, what do you think is the best way to pass this information along? All right, Maurice, thank you very much. A very important question raised there. Why can't the experts agree on this topic? This question was posed in one of the chat boxes really uh, the issue of what seems to be poor communication between scientists, and I think it needs to be addressed. Thank you very much for that brief comment. Esther Matu, please. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, well, I had a question for Dr. Mugira. Unfortunately, he has left, but just in case uh, no, I had no, I'm, asked- I'm still, I'm hanging on I'm Kidogo as I, I hear I, through. I, yes, Esther. Yes, I know, good to connect. Eh? Yes, I'm still very interested in getting to understand who in this country is conducting safety assessment on GM foods, which agency is doing it, and is this information available to the public? Because I think for me that is important because those are a bit to me that is what the public is not getting to understand. When you we, we have no problem with the technology per se, but the issues of risks and safety are very pertinent, and I think we need to have that information appealed to the public. Number two, um, maybe to Professor Odul. Uh, going back to that paper, people don't want to talk about the Celalini paper. If I read it correctly and I got to understand, the issue was not about the gene. The issue was about the herbicide, the glyphosate herbicides. And I think we are using them. We are going to continue using them. Why don't we address that? Because there's evidence that some of those are herbicides or chemicals have been shown to have a, an positive 
association with cancer. Forget about cancer, the issue of allergies. I'm just wondering, is it possible for the molecular biologists to, uh, to work alongside health biomedical researchers to ensure that even as we come up with new technologies, we are addressing the health concerns? And I'm thinking some of these, some of these experiments are straightforward. I mean, you, I mean, testing, uh, you know, a product in, in a small rodent like mice, of course, you have to follow the protocols. It's not difficult. Why don't we develop our own data? I mean, generate our own data so that we can be talking to the Kenyan public using our own local data. And, and I'm thinking this is possible. And if we can be able to address that, I mean, of course, there are also other health, I mean, environmental concerns. But what I'm saying is that we need to have our own locally generated answer so that at least we can tell the public we have done this and this is what we have found out. Thank you very much. And I look forward to much, many more webinars. This is very informative. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, 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 Esther. Certainly very good. And this question had been asked to, to post our own work on safety of GM, and I hope our researchers are listening. The next one, now we are coming to the very end of the, the last question. Raf Gogi, please. Um, uh, hi, ladies and gentlemen. I am, I am just a concerned uh, a citizen. I'm not in the bio world. I'm actually a network engineer. However, mine is more of a comment than a question. Uh, one is that I feel that many many of the scientists will always say the same thing. They say, "Oh, science is uh, is consistent. Science is like this. Science has never been consistent, and uh, that that is that is a fact. Science has always uh, has always moved with politics or with the person who is paying the, the, the scientist. That is very consistent. Number two, and, and that is why we have a lot of fallout. And once the people fall out, they are unheard of." They are uh, shut down in the social media and everything. So that is part of it. So for me is is, um, is to ask that uh, both parties stop scaring the rest of us. Don't tell us, oh, you'll die of hunger. Uh, the other guys will say you start growing horns. Let's be objective. Uh, you know, let's be objective and also be cognizant of the of the fact that there's a lot. There's a lot of conspiracy theories that are actually true. Like uh, somebody trying to say biotechnology, uh, bio, biochemicals is uh, you require to die tomorrow. No, these guys are, are very strategic. They want you to die. They don't want you to die today because what they want to do is they want to create a, a client. So they immunize you when you're young, but you'll be susceptible to certain conditions when you're older and you'll start paying them for another drug that is there. And uh, and that is that is very... That is very true, but most of us will not agree. Uh, on the issue of uh, uh, GMO, sometimes we, we must be very careful. Sometimes we go look for something that can do this, but uh, it, it turns out and does something else that is different. So you might end up having like the golden rice where you just have food that makes you full, then you become again, then again we become dependent on, uh, on, vitamin, on vitamin supplement or mineral supplement. So this thing needs to be looked into very well. And I want to go back and say that it's good if we as Kenyans continue doing our research, because then our research is, 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 uh, is, uh, is uh, targeted based. It works for us, it is a solution for us, and then it has the, the best interest of us in heart. For the guy talking about mosquitoes being uh, whatever, um, technology about mosquitoes in the US, of course, there's a concern because I mean, why are you being so generous to us when you really, really don't like us that much? Um, as 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 time has shown, it is also very good. It's also something that we should not over rely on um, on seeds coming from other from other quarters. Uh, or and um, I, I, Huawei is a very good example where Huawei was seen to be a threat, whether it is true what they have been accused of or not. Uh, a government uh, a government policy came up and they said, yo, we're not buying this. So Kenya, for example, would turn down a, a UN resolution. Maybe. And uh, guess what? You're call, considered unfriendly and they stop sending seeds to you. What do we do? We'll be left stranded. So we have to be very careful, some, uh, very careful and very focused. And we must be selfish in that we must look for ourselves and our next generation for us to thrive as a nation and as a people. Thank you, ladies okay. and gentlemen. Giving me okay. that chance. Thank you. Thank you very much, Raf. Uh, observations, good points there. 
the, the last, I, I will ask that everyone allows me only to take one more comment and then we'll close it there. That will be from uh, Nicholas Coril. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Maina, and thanks everybody. This has been a very useful discourse. My name is Nicholas Coril from the School of Agriculture, Kenyatta University. Mine uh, was just to speak to the scientists in this forum. Let us take this message to the farmers because there is a lot of mis misinformation. There is a lot of misunderstanding. But as uh, Dr. King puts it, let us go with the facts. I just wanted to highlight the aspect whereby we have seen it that the seed sector is controlled by multinationals. It's not true. The biggest share of the seed sector in Kenya is controlled by the local company. And therefore, this tool of GM, GM technology would be a very useful tool to the seed industry in Kenya and to the wider agricultural community. So the key aspect here is communication and communication and communication. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. I, I will ask, uh, I, I know there are, there are two, I, I've seen Noah, I've seen your question on who is talking to the farmers. I hope that's what you wanted to ask. And uh, John, keep your going, please. If you have a question, you can type it in the chat because I will. I only have one minute and I would like before we close, we still have two, 10 people on the platform. And this is certainly very, very good. You have honored us with your presence. Before we call upon the moderator to summarize the key points for today. Half a minute, half a minute. And please, our speakers, half a minute each. Is, is Dr. Mugira there? Are you there? Uh, yes. Yes, please. Please take a short time and respond to some of the issues that were raised. Uh, very quickly, that was directed uh, to me is who is doing the food assessment uh, in other countries. Uh, the Katayana Protocol identifies uh, institutions that are called national focal points. For Kenya, for example, uh, the National Biosafety Authority, it, it identifies both the institution and the person. So I am the focal point and the institution is the focal point for the Katayana protocol. We are the ones responsible for food safety assessment. It can be conducted by an institution that we, we assign to do that, but generally we are responsible for the food feed safety, environmental safety and socioeconomic assessment. Is the information accessible to the public? Yes. We regularly update information on a platform called the BCH, the Biological, uh, the Biosafety Clearing House, which is also a component of the protocol. And of course, like I said earlier, the question is, how accessible is this? Uh, can anyone go there? Can, uh, can you tell somebody in, um, in a farm in Moranga, for example, go to the BCH and check the, out this information? But it is available. It is a platform for sharing information. So when we do risk assessment, we refer to the findings of our counterpart national perform, um, focal points or national uh, uh, authorities for reference. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much. Um, and thank you also for staying on there. Now I would like to ask a uh, uh, Professor Udur, two minutes, and don't take more than two minutes. I, I promise, uh, this time around, I'll only take uh, uh, very short. Nicholas Correll, in terms of the need for the local um, uh, seed companies, yes, that is the kind of discussion that I say that we fought, so that when the new seeds come, to what extent have we involved our local seed companies? That's a good observation, and that's now positive. Uh, Raf, uh, Raf has uh, a lot of uh, good stuff, including the inconsistency of, of, of science. Uh, I, I think that is uh, a statement that people can look at from different points. I wouldn't want to uh, you know, uh, call it inconsistency, but I think I would go with the word incremental, that one science, uh, new innovations actually enrich previous ones and it becomes in incremental. In terms of local research, all of us want local research and that speaks to uh, the specificity of the needs that are local to us. In terms of uh, probably saying that the Americans don't like us so much, and that's the reason why, uh, well, uh, while that probably could be a subjective statement, it wouldn't be very right to really start discussing that then because we now jump into the racism and the ethnicity stuff, and it becomes difficult. But I, I hear where you're coming from. Um, Esther Matu, yes, in terms of safety assessment, that I think uh, uh, Dr. 
uh, Mugira has talked about, but whether we need to work with uh, biomedical guys, that's true. And part of the things like assessing the allergenicity is part of this thing that uh, NBA does very well. They have a panel and we have very good databases where you run that sequence to check to know whether it's likely it's got in a structure, whether it's full of protein that can lead to can lead to uh, you know allergenicity. So yes, that's that, that's the multidisciplinary which every research really needs to adopt. And I agree with you. Morris wonders whether who is harmonizing the voices of scientists so that we speak from the same voice. Yes, uh, very soon you will hear from probably next week or the week after a lot more discussion, particularly from Kenya University Biotechnology Consortium, which is a local consortium that brings together experts of biotechnology from both public and private universities. I am privileged to chair this, and therefore you will see a lot of this discussion. The only unfortunate bit is that the GMO debate is usually very open to any other person, whether you are professional or not, you just wake up and say GMO causes this and you get away with it. But if you can leave this discussion to experts who also engage positively and reach each other, we will be very happy. Then lastly, to, uh, to Miriam Kenywa, by the way, that is a professor, the oldest that I know, who has shaped a lot of discussions around, around uh, breeding and particularly modern breeding. Uh, Prof, the only reason why I, I, I brought in the mutation bit of it is that it's not new. Even during the not you know the early stages of mutation breeding, you also will appreciate that there are a lot of discussion around it and whether it was supposed to qualify as as, as a new uh, modern biotechnology or otherwise. And it went through this kind of debate that we are having with the, with, with the GMO. The bit, the lenses through which I was associating linking the two is that when you pick a gene from whatever source and put it into another, you have done an insertion. And in that case, through that lens, it looks like a mutation because you brought in a new gene. That's the lens through which I was looking at it. But holistically, your comment on objectivity, you know we bring to this together, particularly from your days of NBA. Thank you so much, Chair. Let me stop at that point. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Odur, for those insights again. So now the the last uh, speaker, I, I would like to, before Anne, are you there, Anne? I'm here. Okay, uh, Anne, you are, you are going to give your, your comments. Uh, and, and then just before, because I, I realize we have farmers in the Mideast, but we haven't heard their voice. Noah, on behalf of the farming community and for gracing our moment, I'll give you two minutes after Anne, and you will have the, the last comment before our moderator wraps it up for us. So Anne, you can respond to any issues that were raised. Thank you very much. I think I'll go, I'll speak uh, on the general angle because a lot has been said, but just to say that uh, quite often uh, we get a lot of bashing when raising concerns about uh, genetically engineered crops. Huh? Uh, we are not against technology. In fact, we are happy to work with uh, researchers to improve and do local uh, research that is beneficial. For example, uh, we when we talk about agroecology, and it is not a very simple thing, we'd like to work with the likes of Professor Dor and others to do that scientific analysis when we produce bokashi and other biofertilizers to get those ingredient, active ingredients, understand them and how they operate. But it is important that ethical issues that we have raised, socioeconomic, environmental, and even uh, the effects that uh, the linkage of genetically modified organism, be they insect resistant, herbicide tolerant, or what uh, we are calling stacked genes, which have been rejected even in South Africa, even with their open regime, they have refused stacked varieties because it is not fully understood how they, how they react when you have insect resistance, uh, herbicide tolerant, drought resistant put in one uh, particular uh, crop or a variety. And so it's important that is, this, we engage on these issues. We still are very concerned about the issues related, especially to trade, who will own the seed. Yes, these companies have been operating and selling hybrids, but the ultimate game changer is uh, the GMOs and particularly maize, and you may question yourself why there's no GMO wheat, which is a staple in Europe and other countries, but we are, there's a big push to have GMOs in Africa. It has never been an issue of uh, 
uh, food insecurity has not been an issue of uh, not uh, it available, but if you can afford it, you can access the food. Many go to hungry, even in America where there are GMOs every day, but those who have resources access can be able to access it. So once again, thank you very much, Kenyatta University. This was a wonderful webinar. We hope we can engage in more uh, so that uh, we can keep the discussions alive. Uh, Asante Nisana. Thank you very much, Anne. Thank you for staying with us and also for honoring us despite having extended the time. Noah Nasiali. Noah, if you're there, you need to turn on your mic if you are speaking. Okay, I don't know whether Noah is online. His head, his head is up, and I would have wished to give him an opportunity on behalf of farmers. He had asked who is speaking to farmers. But uh, ladies and gentlemen, colleagues, thank you so much. We, we are coming to the end of the seminar. We have uh, had a good interaction. We have listened. We have questioned. Uh, I know we have not agreed uh, on everything, but where we have disagreed, it has been with respect and decorum. And we have pointed out, we have been pointed to the capabilities we have as a nation. And we have looked into the issue of our readiness as a country to uh, import, grow, and consume genetically modified organisms. I am pleased we have had insights into some of the controversies that remain to be resolved through debates and interactions like this. And we have identified our fears. I hope we go forward with a renewed determination to, to continue improving our understanding and, and, and really uh, our efforts to change the situation in our Hello? country. I, I would like to... Hello? Uh, yes, Noah. Hi. Uh, uh, are you there? Yes, I'm here. Can you hear me? Uh, okay. Okay. Yes, we can. Please speak now. Yeah, brilliant. So I, uh, I work with quite a number of farmers uh, across Sub-Saharan Africa. And, and uh, really recently, I've also appointed the. Uh, you can hear me? I can hear you, but you need to speak closer to your microphone. Okay, you can hear me? Yes, we can. Yes, so recently, I've also appointed the, the Brown Ambassador of Alliance for Science, which is talking to farmers specifically. But what I'm asking is that why are we not having. Um, farmers being in being involved in these discussions directly. When I talk about farmers being involved in these discussions, we see a lot is being done from research level. We know Kenya and Africa at large is a research, research continent, but some of this research is not, does not reach farmers. So farmers make uh, wrong decisions. I've been farming for 16 years now, and some of the decisions I, I, I made when I was farming is, are, are decisions that were informed by lack of clear, basic dissemination of information. For example, we're talking about GMO. Is GMO good? We are seeing a lot of firefighting. We are seeing firefighting from, from anti-GMO organizations. Where were they when farmers were facing losses, challenges, and all that? What were they doing at that time? Are they coming out? Is it, is it a political war against government to say they're opposing GMO? And, and what is GMO? We hear about GMO and gene editing. Uh, where is this research? We are hearing some, some guy in France that did some research that was against GMO and all that. We are seeing a lot of GMO being done and, uh, and, and trials being done in Kenya. Can we be able to have an opportunity to go and see this, talk to the farmers who are doing these trials to see the plus and minus? We, uh, we, we, we are farmers. We want to do it for money, but we also want to make sure that our fellow Kenya, Kenyans are also uh, eating food. Uh, what is the difference between GMO and hybrid? Um, is GMO compared, if you do a, if you do a rough, uh, estimate, rough, rough comparison, is GMO the same with the broiler chicken? And is uh, the normal Kenyaji chicken, is it, is gene editing the same with improved curry kienyeji chicken? What is this? Let us stop talking about jargon. Let us talk about, let us simplify that research. Research is only good if end users actually benefit from it. I work with close to 580,000 uh, smallholder farmers across Sub-Saharan Africa. What they want is something that they can be able to grow, reduce pesticide use, use as well. We want to make sure that that research is not only being funded. That research is also being a reality. Kenya can produce food. 
Kenya can be able to produce food and feed even parts of, of, of Africa. We have the potential, we have the land and all that. Let us stop politicizing the GMO. It is just unfortunate that GMO, the debate came up with the new government, but it's something that has been there. Let us be factual, let us be realistic, let us talk to the smallholder farmers and ask them the hard questions. Let us listen to them. I've not had, fortunately now, uh, because of Dr. Dr. Nicholas, who I've been able to now speak on behalf of farmers as well. Let us stop politicizing it. I, I, I say stop politicizing because I have never seen, I just saw the anti-GMO organizations coming up so loudly when the GMO ban was lifted. Where were they before that? You know, uh, we talk about fertilizer and all that, but without good seed, without improved seed, we cannot have proper yield. I stand as a smallholder farmers. I am pro GMO, but obviously with specific facts. So if we can be able to work together, I run an organization called A Farmers Media, where we disseminate information that conk research information being broken down to smallholder farmers so that they understand that whatever they're doing, it is a choice and let us stop scaring them. I have not seen someone who has eaten GMO across the world of travel who has six figures because of eating GMO. No, let us, let us be factual. Let us not have research that is not uh, factual. Let, even if it is factual, let us help smallholder farmers understand their role in the place of producing food and let us help them do the right thing. Thank you. Thank you so much. This could go on and on and on. I think we've got to bring it to an end at some point. I know we've eaten into all your time and our time, and we have to wrap it up there. So uh, allow me, please, please, uh, I can see there are many more issues coming up. Allow me to please invite uh, the moderator now. The, the, yeah, indeed, the rapporteur, Mary Mwangi. Please uh, just give us a summary of the key highlights of this day's event. Thank you so much. Sorry, I was still muted. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Maina, uh, for this opportunity. Uh, thank you to our panelists, all the participants. I see we still have over 200 participants. So clearly this webinar has raised uh, a lot of interest at a time that in Kenya we are grappling with the uh, painful situations of children and uh, you know, livestock dying from hunger. And uh, we have uh, had very good interactions, both from the panelists and from the participants, a lot of insights, a lot of education. And for once, uh, the uh, discussion on GMO has not been heated. People are sober. So I think we are getting somewhere. Now, what I've picked from this um, uh, discourse uh, uh, from our, from our present presenters, uh, the three presenters have raised uh, the fact that there are genuine and legitimate public concerns. And this happens in the time you have a new product, especially food products, even if they are not GMOs and you know, even like vaccines. And these concerns are legitimate and we are all listening. The government is listening, the scientists are listening and the, the, the general public is listening. And what has come out uh, very some of these fears, some of these concerns arise from misinformations and misconceptions. You know, some are perceived risks arising from myths and fears. And we need to uh, distinguish between perceived risks and real risks that are based on scientific assessment. And Pro uh, Dr. Mugira clearly uh, explained the process that this GMO research takes, uh, takes uh, you know, the risk assessment based on international standards. So we are saying that we are listening. And I would say, according to uh, the discourse today, I would say that Kenya is ready for GMOs and has been ready for more than 20 years. And that the government and the, the scientists are very, you know, are, are, are people of integrity. And you know we are, we are we are going forward in in the right direction. The other point that came out very clearly from uh, Professor Odwal's um, presentation is that GMO is not a panacea. It's not the only tool that will help us to solve the problems that we are facing, the problems of hunger, disease, and all that. 
but it was it's one of among other tools and i and i think i uh, even some other participants talked about a complementary approach important thing is this that gmo has shown uh, potential the gm technology has shown potential to solve problems that may not otherwise be solved using conventional breeding and therefore uh, uh, we cannot sit back as science advances to provide solutions we need to think about uh, uh, adopting these uh, you know, emerging technologies. And most important, our decisions on GMOs, and I had even the farmers say so, need to be guided by credible, credible scientific evidence while focusing on our needs and unique challenges. So it is not either GMO or other technologies, it is, also, it is a, a combination of agroecological approaches, organic farming, and very importantly, the focus on safe biotechnology. The other point that came out very clear is the role of science and credible science for that matter. But we also need to stop being so rigid. We need to cross check misinformations. Don't believe every publication you see ensure that it's a credible, uh, you know, a credible publication, you need to interrogate. And I, I hear you and when you say that we can work together. So we need to score for a step or stop from debating to dialoguing. So we need to talk to each other rather than at each other, based again on a uh, guided by science. We need uh, more public, participation, and I hope the Directorate of, of Research can organize more of these webinars. Maybe in the next session, we should have uh, you know, presentations by you know, journalists, by communication experts, by the farmers, by policy makers, so that we, we are in a better position to dialogue together. And therefore, we are saying we need not politicize the technology. We need to also think about, about and from uh, the point of view of the university, we are concerned. We, are, we have a, a large program on biotechnology and our students keep asking us, <clears throat> with all this debate, why are you training us in biotechnology? And we are thinking about, we, we are thinking about our youth and you know, crea creating jobs. So let us focus on this in a more sober way. Uh, as I talk about uh, public participation, someone raised the issue of gender issues. We scientists are, are, are cognizant of the fact that farmers, stakeholders are both men and women, and therefore their interests are taken uh, into consideration. The importance of more investments to tap into emerging technologies, now that we have more precise technologies like gene, genome editing cannot be overemphasized. I hear some people uh, you know, criticizing uh, the source of funding. If this funding is going to help us to solve our problems, I don't think we need to, 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 to really be very concerned about uh, you know, uh, whether we, we are going to be influenced by the fathers. The issues of biosafety have been raised and this, the, the regulators are very, are very conscious about. Issues of biosecurity, the possibility to abuse the technology have also been raised. So what I would say in a nutshell, I picked from the discussion is that Kenya is ready for GMOs. That's the question that we were answering today. And thank you very much for this opportunity. Thank you very much, Mary, for capturing, uh, distilling what has come from the deliberations today. There are many issues, and these are good points for follow up. Thank you so much. So, uh, this is uh, my last minute to speak. So, I thank you all. Before you leave, we, we have uh, 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 Professor Omoyo to pass the vote of thanks and then close for us. I thank you all. I thank our speakers. Thank you all for staying with us all. Through. Thank you, Professor Omoyo. Please take the mic. Thank you. Thank you, the, 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 mo the moderator. We are very grateful for what you have done. Uh, first, I want to thank our eminent speakers for today. We are very grateful for what you have done. That is uh, Dr. Roy, Executive G uh, that is Chief Executive Officer, National Biotechnology Authority, Professor Udori, uh, Acting Registrar, uh, Madam uh, Han, the National Coordinator of Biosafety. Uh, our, uh, our able moderator, uh, Professor Maina, and uh, 
Mary Mangi, thank you very much for the, the work that you have done. It is very clear from this that uh, 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 GMO is a way of trying to improve the production. And using genetically modified technology is a way of trying to improve, of course, the, the, the production. And it's a, 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 one of the techniques which can be used to complement already the existing technology. So we are very, very, very grateful on this discussion. I want to thank those who organized for this particular web, webinar. It is very, very educative. It has come at a very right time when the ban on the, uh, on the GMO has been lifted in Kenya. This is very, very great. So Dr. Dr. Roy, I want to thank you for giving us a clear, clear information that we already have guidelines which are existing on monitoring the GMOs, the regulation among the agencies, how to steps to apply for the imports of the, of the various products and the advancement which has been done. And therefore we are very, very grateful for that. And I, I wish we give him a crap for what he has done for us. Please let us give him three craps. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Roy. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And uh, you are most welcome again. Uh, Professor Oduol, thank you very much because you have given us uh, enlightened us about what the GMOs are. You have really tried to explain some of the work that is going on in Kenya. Maybe some, some, some of us have not been very conversant on what has been going on. We are the... Uh, some of us maybe who are in the, in, in the, in the webinar, but uh, there's a lot of work which is going on in, 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 in Kenya, particularly in KU, we have a lot. And, uh, and therefore this is a way forward in trying to improve the production. And uh, I, I am very happy that you were able to talk about, even at the gene level, you went up the point to explain so that our members can be able to understand. And therefore I'm very grateful and we want to thank you for that kind of uh, the presentation that you have made. We also want to give you three craps. Please, we give him three craps. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for that, uh, Professor Duell. Uh, I want also to, uh, I want to thank uh, 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 Madam Ann Maina for your good presentation, your concerns always in any presentation or anything which happens, we always have the concerns, people might have concerns, but we need to read deeper so that you can be, we can be able uh, to integrate the information and give the, uh, the, the farmers and all the, the people who are using the products to have the information. But I really like your concern which you presented because it's also good to give the presentations so that the, the, the participants also understands and also with having more detail, it is also very, very important. But the point is that as, as we look at this, it is important that we understand this, where the source of this information, whether we have scientific in, evidence in, in between it. But I really thank you because always it's also good to have some concerns. So can we also give our three claps, please? Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Anne, for that. Uh, our moderator, Professor Mwangi, you have done it well. You have done very good work today. And I really like the way you have moderated the session. And we want also to give you three claps for this. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Mwangi. Uh, our, our moderator, Mary Mwangi, you have done it very well. You have done the summary and I really like it, the way you are focused on it and that is very great. So we also give you three claps for this. Thank you very much, thank you very much. I want to thank all the participants, the farmers, our learned friends, the scientists for participating. The questions which you have presented today are very good. They are very good in the sense that they are opening our mind about the genetically modified uh, crops. This is very good. It is good for us, all of us to understand. 
And it is very timely, as I said, by having this webinar, it opens us our mind and we even get the clear picture of what we are talking about the GMO, because there are many who do not know about the GMOs, because I know that even those ones who talk about even tissue culture materials are GMOs. But by having such a kind of webinar, introducing the, uh, alerting the farmers, uh, sensitizing the farmers, sensitizing the uh, professors, senior lecturers, lecturers, even other scientists, this one will be very, very important, particularly those ones who have never uh, been very, uh, uh, who have not got the in-depth of these genetically modified crops. And take note that, for example, there is one thing that like Professor Odori talked about, like the production of insulin. That is a genetically modified product. Nobody has ever complained about it for the control of diabetes. So it is good we have the in-depth about these GMOs and it is very good. So I, I want to take this opportunity to thank all our participants for participating during this webinar. And we really welcome you another time. So we give them three claps, please. Thank you, thank you very much. Thank you very much for, for the participation. And generally, I want to say that I'm very grateful and uh, uh, for your information, I'm one of the person who, have, who has dealt with genetically modified crops and uh, I've done some work on it. And uh, whatever we do in the lab, we don't do it for the sake of harming our people. The, the purpose is to try to produce something which, is, uh, which can be utilized by us our, ourselves in that particular case. And it is a good idea, but we have to read in depth so that you understand, because in case, you find that there are some areas you are not understanding, let us consult further and so that you can be able to understand. But this is a compliment. It's a compliment technology in, because there are many other technology, but this is one of them which has been shown to improve the production. So I want to thank you all, and I wish that in the future, we have such a kind of whenever webinar so that we can be able to get more information. So back to you, Professor Mwangi. Okay, thank you very much, uh, uh, Professor Moyo, and to everyone, all our participants. This marks the, the end of the webinar today. God bless you, and may you have a good afternoon, uh, wherever you are. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Goodbye. Thank you. Thank you, and goodbye. Thank you, and goodbye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, and goodbye.